The sun rises over the battlefield. The American flag flaps gently in the wind. The world is silent. Bang! The door slams open, and the boy runs out of the house, making plane noises with his mouth. The toy bomber in his hand arcs and soars, dipping and diving, as it makes its imaginary bombing run around the backyard. Over the sandbox, swooping low through the thick grass, past the pond, under the swing set, and up, up, and away into the sky, climbing higher and higher in the direction of the treehouse, with its American flag flapping in the morning breeze. What a perfect day. The boy breathes in the air deeply and looks around. His shoulders slump. He's bored already. Two seconds in the yard and he's already bored. What is there to do out here that he hasn't already done? He's played in the sand, he's swung on the swings, he's climbed up to the treehouse. He hears the car engine kicking into life somewhere out front. His dad's voice carries over to him on the breeze. I'm running late for work, I'll see you later. If you find my bag anywhere, don't go looking inside of it, just tell me where it is when I get home. Love you, bye. The wheels crunch through the gravel driveway, and the engine sound slowly fades into the distance, leaving the boy alone in the backyard again, with nothing but the wind for company. Great, now he's got to find something to do for the whole day. He throws the toy bomber to the ground in frustration. A wing snaps off and bounces away into the flower bed. Uh-oh, he'll need to fix that before Dad gets home. Super glue, that'll do the trick. There must be some inside, his dad is always fixing things. But the boy's mission is almost immediately sidetracked. As soon as he steps into the house, he spots his dad's bag right by the back door, where he always forgets to look. The boy looks at it curiously for a moment. He wonders what's in there that his dad told him not to look at. He'll just have a little peek, not a proper look. He won't even open the bag all the way, just a little look inside. If anyone asks, he'll say he was looking for super glue. Wait, what's that? It can't be. A little pot with a red lid and big cartoonish letters on the side. Play-Doh? What's his dad doing with a pot of Play-Doh in his bag? He thought his dad had a really grown-up job. That's what his mom always says. His dad has a very secret grown-up job, very important, very secret. Is that really what he does at work all day, play with Play-Doh? The boy is far too grown up for Play-Doh. He hasn't played with it for years because it's for babies. No way is he going to play with it now. Nope, he's a big boy who plays with real toys. But still, a little look won't hurt. He'll take it out, squeeze it in his hands a bit, remember how babyish it is, and put it back. He definitely isn't going to play with it. The boy pops the red lid off and peers inside. Yep, just as he thought. Boring. Just a lump of red putty. Sitting there being all... all boring. But as the boy tips the pot out into his hand, it feels a bit weird. It moves a little in his palm. Is there an insect inside it or something? It feels like a pair of little legs. He rolls the lump over into his other hand and peers at it. Yes, a pair of legs sticking out from the red ball. Only, they're not insect legs at all. They're tiny, about the size of insect legs, but there are only two of them. They're totally red, matching the color of the Play-Doh, and seem to have a tiny pair of boots on the ends of them. The legs wiggle around helplessly, sticking up into the air, until all of a sudden, a hand appears sticking up out of the clay. It looks like a tiny person has somehow been buried in the Play-Doh upside down. The hand gets a good grip on the red ball, and pushes and pulls at it, steadily freeing the rest of its body, until suddenly, a fully formed tiny man pops out of the surface. Roughly the size of the boy's fingernail, the little red man stands up straight and takes in his surroundings. Not only is the tiny person wearing boots, he's also got a backpack and a helmet on his miniature head, all made of Play-Doh. In fact, this tiny person looks just like one of those little green army man toys that his dad had when he was little. The little soldier looks up and sees the boy staring down at him, jumping back in fright. The boy laughs. He guesses he must look pretty scary to someone so small. He smiles at the little army man. The little army man very slowly lowers himself down to his knees, reaching down to the Play-Doh floor he's standing on. His little red hand seems to be feeling around for something in the putty. In fascination, the boy stares closely as the Play-Doh under the soldier's hand morphs into the shape of… what is that? A gun? The soldier lifts the tiny red rifle to his shoulder and points it straight at the boy's eye. He fires, and to the boy's surprise, something comes out. A stream of teeny tiny Play-Doh bullets pepper his eyeball. The boy throws the Play-Doh ball as hard as he can and blinks hard. A tiny scream goes with it. The bullets didn't really hurt that much, but his eye is a little watery now. The tiny soldier has a real working tiny assault rifle. He's starting to understand why his dad is still playing with Play-Doh. Where did that Play-Doh go? He must have thrown it into the backyard. The boy runs outside and looks around. 
There it is, just next to the sandbox. He creeps up to the ball cautiously, trying to see if the little soldier is still there. Wait, hang on, there he is. No, there he is. Is that another one? He kneels and peers at the small crowd gathering around the ball. He can't quite believe what he's seeing. Dozens of little men are milling around the red ball, with more marching out of it in formation every few seconds. Little red Play-Doh tents are being erected in a perimeter around the ball. A couple of tiny soldiers chop down a twig with tiny red axes and start a campfire. A mini red jeep weaves its way through the grass, and a general hops out, with a cowering officer by his side. The tiny general barks tiny orders. It's difficult to hear what the man is saying, but it sounds like he's speaking English, only really high-pitched. He points to a group of soldiers who immediately rush over to the ball of Play-Doh and pull a ladder out of it. They rest the ladder against the edge of the sandbox, and a couple of them hurry their way to the top. Climbing up onto the wooden board, the pair of them split up, rifles in hand, checking the area is clear. The general is the next up the ladder. He surveys the yard with a battle-worn wariness, eyes coming to rest on the treehouse. He pulls out his binoculars and takes a good hard look at it, studying every inch of the tree before spotting the flagpole rising from the top. Lowering the binoculars with evident satisfaction, the general points a tiny hand at the enormous tree and cries out an order at the top of his little voice. A high pitch rises from the troops on the ground. They pump fists and slap backs. The army has grown already. As the boy looks back down at the platoon gathering in the grass, he sees a dozen more tents have sprung up. A group of soldiers stand in formation around the ball of Play-Doh, keeping watch in every direction. And there, a soldier sits on an acorn crying. Helmet in his hands, he weeps openly. There is a red cross on the tent next to him. That must be the medical tent. The boy crouches down on all fours and peers inside the tent. There, on the tiny red bed, surrounded by tiny red nurses, lies a soldier. His legs are bent out of shape, and he's crying out in pain. A doctor approaches and gives him the bad news before readying the saw. The boy sits back up. He can't watch. A high-pitched cry echoes from the tent, loud enough to dampen the commotion around the rest of the camp. The boy recognizes that scream. It's the same scream he heard when he threw the Play-Doh out of the door. That first brave soldier, defending his brothers-in-arms from the giant. What had the boy done? The soldier outside the medical tent picks up the phone and informs the tiny soldier's tiny family what had happened. He had lost both his legs, but not his life. He was a hero. The battalion is mobilizing. No time to mourn. Snipers climb the ladder onto the edge of the sandbox and set up nests all along the wooden beam as trucks rumble through the thick grass below. On the other side of the sandbox wall, a desert platoon makes its way through the scorching heat. Soldiers sit atop tanks, shaking the last remaining drops of doughy water from their red bottles and wiping sweat from their brows, all of them heading in the direction of the treehouse. The boy stands up, surrounded by tiny soldiers. He has to be careful where he steps now as they fill the grass around him. A couple of tanks rumble between his feet, flattening the blades of grass as if they were as weak as, well, blades of grass. All of the soldiers, all of the equipment and vehicles, everything is coming from the little ball of red Play-Doh. And little is the right word for it. With every new unit deployed to the front line, the ball shrinks slightly. It's getting smaller and smaller by the minute. They're going to need reinforcements. The boy rushes into the house and returns in just a few seconds, arms laden with Play-Doh. He's got every pot of it from when he was little. He pops them all open, one after the other, and throws them onto the ground in the midst of the camp. The only slight issue is that all the Play-Doh is that gross brown color that it goes when you mix all the colors together. That won't matter, will it? Gunfire breaks out almost immediately below him. The boy jumps back in surprise, stepping on a communications mast by accident. Tiny brown soldiers rush out of the Play-Doh balls all around the camp, diving into cover and opening fire on the red soldiers. It's a massacre. Red soldiers taking a rest from the front line, calling their loved ones, getting ready to go home on leave, lying injured in beds. All of them are gunned down. Most don't even have a chance to grab their rifles. One brave red soldier sprints to the communications mast and tries to radio the rest of the battalion, telling them what's happened, but the mast is destroyed. A stray bullet catches him in the side of his head, and he crumbles to the ground, just a lifeless blob of Play-Doh. The boy watches in horror as a couple of brown soldiers pick up the body and toss it into the nearest ball of brown Play-Doh. A dedicated team of them mix the body in with the rest of the dough until it's that same brown color. From the blob emerges a new brown soldier. The small red streak running across his heart is the only sign that he'd ever been a red at all. The soldier quickly disappears amongst the mass of helmets and boots, trampling any trace of the red army. The whole yard erupts in tiny warfare. 
The red snipers lining the walls of the sandbox are picked off one after the other. The desert platoon are ambushed by landmines and quickly surrounded, hiding in broken down tanks as plumes of sand are thrown up all around them. Before long, the brown troops have them completely surrounded. One last soldier bursts out from the hatch in his tank, holding grenades in each hand. The bullet catches him in the head before he can even finish his war cry. The grenades explode harmlessly, nowhere near the brown troops. The red convoy, on its way to the tree, stands the best chance of survival. The boy follows them with fascination, watching as the brown army fight their way through the red line from the back, splitting it through the middle as their superior firepower makes short work of the transport and supply trucks. Some red soldiers dive away into the thick grass, climbing up dandelions and weeds in a desperate attempt to escape. Few succeed, as the bodies fall back into the mud like raindrops. A tiny screaming noise fills the yard. The boy turns around just in time to jump out of the way of the brown fighter jets. Five of them streak through the air, almost at his head height. Missiles fire out of the bottom of each jet, one after the other, blowing apart what little remains of the red convoy. The gunfire dies down within the hour. Skirmishes break out across the yard as brown patrols pick off the stragglers they find from the Red Army hiding in ants' nests, under fallen leaves, and huddling around broken down vehicles. The boy watches as several high-ranking officers gather in the brown base to oversee the absorption of the last of the red ball of Play-Doh. They mold themselves a big meeting table with a brown map of the yard and plot out their strategy for taking the treehouse for themselves, moving around even tinier little model units across the surface of it with sticks. The plan quickly comes together before the boy's eyes and under his feet. A series of mortars and surface-to-air missiles are deployed along the wall of the sandbox. The Air Force takes over the original brown base, chopping down blades of grass and laying out Play-Doh runways flanked with brown hangars. A ring of military units surround the base of the treehouse, strategizing about how best to ascend the colossal structure and reach the flagpole. In the pond, an aircraft carrier splashes into the water, marking the arrival of the Navy. The ship is soon flanked by a pair of destroyers armed with anti-aircraft missiles. The boy is about to go over and peer into the water to try and spot a nuclear submarine when he comes across a sight for sore eyes. Red soldiers, not much more than a single squadron, hunkered down around the base of the swing set. They've covered themselves in dirt and little clumps of moss to camouflage. They must be the forwardmost scout squadron, just far enough away from that original convoy to escape the slaughter. But what are they doing? The units are all gathered around a pile of leaves. There's something underneath. What is it? It looks like plastic. Of course, it's his toy bomber with the broken wing. Trying not to draw the attention of the brown army, the boy drops to the ground next to the red units, doing his best to hide in the grass. The red soldiers are arguing amongst themselves. The general is there. He's survived, but barely, slumped against a blade of grass. The scout's high-pitched arguing is a little too quiet for the boy to make out, but it's pretty clear what's going on. They need to get the toy plane working but it'll be hopeless without the other wing. He lifts his head and looks around the yard. There it is, in the flower bed. But it's surrounded by brown troops. How could the red soldiers possibly fight their way to it and get back unharmed? Oh, wait. The boy just gets up, walks over to the flower bed, and picks up the wing. In about three seconds, he completes an insurmountable effort for those little soldiers. Kneeling next to them, he offers the missing wing. The scouts all stand back warily. It's the general who climbs to his feet and walks over to the boy. He looks at the plastic wing, looks up at the giant towering over him, and raises his arm in a salute. The others follow suit quickly and get to work repairing the toy plane. Brown soldiers notice the commotion and start to close in on them. They don't have much time. The boy stamps out a runway for the soldiers in the grass. The plane is almost ready to go, but is missing one vital piece of the propeller. Only there's a bigger problem. They're out of red Play-Doh. A brown soldier breaks through the thick grass and rushes towards the squadron, his assault rifle peppering the side of the plane with doughy bullets. The scouts all dive into the vehicle and kick the engine into gear. Little red gears and pistons whir into life beneath the plastic, but the plane just isn't moving without the propeller. What can they do? The brown soldier stops in his tracks, staring at the plane. The boy peers at him closer. There's a red streak across his heart. Conflict contorts the tiny soldier's face. The door to the plane opens, and out steps the general. The two soldiers face each other on the runway, the Red Scouts desperately calling the general to get back in. None of them move. The brown soldier raises his rifle and shoots the general in the head. The older man crumples to the ground. Inside the plane, the scouts start to panic. They don't have their guns with them. The brown army is bearing down on them from all sides. What can they do? The brown soldier with the streak across his heart walks slowly over to the general's body, stoops down, and picks him up. He carries the body around to the front of the plane, and without a word, 
starts using the Play-Doh to build them a propeller. Brown soldiers burst through the grass, swarming the runway. They need to leave, now or never. The brown soldier places the propeller onto the plane and steps aside as the vehicle roars off along the runway. He salutes the ascending plane as one of his brown compatriots puts a bullet in his chest right through his red heart. But the plane is already away, lifting off into the sky. The toy bomber dodges and weaves its way between the whizzing bullets. It banks hard, pulling the nose around inch by inch to face the treehouse. The pilot guns it, pulling the tiny stick back sharply. It seems to take an age for the bomber to climb. The boy glances behind him just in time to see the brown navy launch their missiles, six of them, all making a beeline for the bomber. Or so it seems. At the last moment, he sticks a hand out and slaps the missiles out of the air. A couple of them explode, leaving streaks of brown Play-Doh on his hand. The others spiral to the ground, where tiny soldiers dive for cover. The brown air force scrambles, but it's too late. As the jets shoot across the yard, the bomber has already reached its destination. The scouts jump out, deploying red Play-Doh parachutes as they circle their way down onto the flagpole. A jet catches up to the bomber and blows it out of the sky. The scouts don't have time to mourn their lost pilot, or any of their dead for that matter. Quick as they can, they cut the American flag free. As it flutters and floats down to the grass, the squadron unfurls its replacement. A red rectangle of Play-Doh, barely a couple of inches across. One of them pulls a bugle from his pack and plays the highest pitch version of the last post you could ever hear. The whole battlefield falls silent to listen. The boy places a hand over his heart just as the first drop of rain hits his shoulder. From somewhere inside, his mom's voice calls. It's about to start raining. Come inside before you catch a cold. I'm making cocoa. The boy grins and runs into the house. Outside, the rain pours and all trace of the war washes away into red and brown streaks in the dirt. And with that, you'd be forgiven for thinking that SCP-705 had never even been in that young boy's backyard. Most adults would just dismiss the boy's afternoon entertainment as a figment of a child's imagination, but most adults have not encountered SCP-705, otherwise known as militarized Play-Doh. The results of a redacted megacorporation's research into creating a self-molding product, the specific mechanics of how this militarized Play-Doh was created are hazy to say the least. What is known is that the small red blob of what appears to be the popular children's sculpting toy exhibits aggressive militaristic tendencies. As soon as the 5-ounce pot is opened, SCP-705 activates, forming itself into miniature Play-Doh soldiers. Each unit comes dressed in detailed and accurate military fatigues, carrying miniaturized weaponry and equipment, all of which function identically to their real-life counterparts, aside from one small detail. Everything is made entirely from Play-Doh. When active, SCP-705 can divide into hundreds of infantrymen, each of which seems to have some level of personal autonomy. As of yet, no hive mind mentality has been observed between the soldiers. They all communicate as their real-life military equivalents would, through barking orders, strategizing, and working together. Upon activation, each instance of SCP-705 is highly territorial, seeking to take immediate control of the nearest location or object that seems to be of strategic importance. This could be anything from a coffee machine to a treehouse. What appear to be innocuous household objects to us pose an incredible tactical advantage to the tiny soldiers, many of whom are willing to sacrifice their lives to take control. The longer this militarized Plato is allowed to roam free, the more advanced the military unit becomes. Leadership figures emerge, battle plans grow more and more advanced, and technology improves. While the Play-Doh may initially take the form of a handful of infantry units, if left to their own devices, these units will soon be riding on the backs of tanks, firing miniguns through the doors of attack helicopters, or even developing rudimentary navies and air forces. And of course, you have seen what happens when SCP-705 comes into contact with a regular pot of Play-Doh. The otherwise harmless putty will take on the same characteristics as this militarized Play-Doh. If the two groups of soldiers are the same color, they will form an alliance. If they are different colors, Well, that's where the fun begins. Containing SCP-705 is relatively straightforward. Simply gathering all of the Play-Doh together and putting it back into its 5-ounce pot with the lid closed will neutralize the tiny army entirely. This, coupled with how harmless the tiny, doughy bullets are, means that SCP-705 requires little security. It is housed in Sector 2 safe SCP containment with the lid closed. The only accidental outbreak that has occurred since its containment has been in the break room when a researcher accidentally left the lid open while they went to the bathroom. When the researcher returned, all they needed to do to rescue their coffee from the clutches of a crazed Play-Doh general was brush a few soldiers off the counter. 
This is a day SCP-705 still talks about often with deep fear and reverence. It's never a nice feeling waking up lying amongst shards of broken glass in the middle of the road. The dawn sky above the biker looks almost peaceful. It's as if nothing had gone wrong at all, as if everything is right in the world. But slowly, the throbbing pain washes into his helmeted head, and the sound of the traffic surrounding him rises in his ears. A sea of onlookers gathers around as the cars blast their horns. Through the cracked visor of his helmet, the biker can see concerned faces, people calling emergency services, and a few women crying. His paramedic bike is toppled on its side about 40 feet from him. There are long black tire marks running up to where it lies, smoking slightly on its side. With a groan, the biker sits himself up and shakes his head. Bad idea. Looking around, though, it seems he's the only one injured. His bike had gone into the front of a car at the junction. The occupants of the car stand by nervously, offering him whatever little assistance they can. But there's no time for that, the biker suddenly realizes. He looks down at his watch frantically. It's 12.03 p.m. There's not enough time. He rushes over to the bike as fast as he can and lifts it back upright. A couple of onlookers try to grab his arms, trying to sit down to rest, but he can't. There's no time. He has just three minutes to get to St. Mary's Hospital in central London. Right now, he's at the junction outside Baker Street Station. He can still make it on time if he gets on his bike and goes now. The biker swings his leg onto the bike and kicks it into life. He takes a deep gulp and looks over his shoulder at the box on the back of his bike. He can't risk opening it here. The damage may already be done. But if the heart is still alive in that box, it is the only chance that a 10-year-old boy has for a normal life. If he doesn't get to the hospital in the next three minutes, his life could be over. The school children stand in a circle, looking down at the dead bird with a morbid fascination. Do you think it's alive? No, no way. The boy in the middle of the group goes to pick up a stick. With an air of false confidence, he walks up to the bird and gives it a prod. It makes a squelching noise. The other kids all reel in shock, making retching noises and laughing about it. It's only when their teacher comes out to call them inside that the group disperses, leaving the animal carcass alone, sitting at the edge of the playground, outside the view of boring adults. Each passing day, the kids wander over to the bird's body. It's kind of the best biology lesson they've ever had as they watch the animal slowly decompose. At first, its body just shrinks, goes flat almost. The feathers start falling out and it loses all of its color. Then it starts to get puffy. Different parts of its flesh bulge out in weird places, as if they're being inflated like a balloon animal at someone's birthday party. But then, the maggots come. There are only a couple of tiny white crawling wrigglers in the bird's body at first, but a couple of days after that, it's infested with them. The creepy crawlies wriggle all over the body. But as the boy looks down at the dead bird, he spots something very peculiar, something they haven't seen in a biology class before. There's a red maggot wriggling and crawling in amongst the rest of the creepy crawlies. It squirms like the rest of them, but even over the course of the school day, it quickly grows larger than any of the others. What do you think it is? The boy stares at it. It looks like a worm. And a worm is exactly what it was. The next day, when the kids return, they see that the red maggot is now much larger than any of the others feasting on the bird. With a slightly translucent body, cherry red coloring, and small white speckles on its skin, it looks unlike anything they've ever seen before. Actually, not unlike anything they've ever seen before, it looks exactly like something that all the kids recognize very well. In fact, one of the kids has a bag of them right now that he's chewing on. A candied worm. The kids stare in curiosity, first at the bag of candy that their friend has in his hand, and then down at the worm, slowly eating its way through the decomposing bird. As far as their eyes can tell, the two things are exactly the same. Except, of course, that the one eating the bird seems to be alive. Kids being kids, the next thing that happened was sort of inevitable. One dares the boy to eat it. He almost wretches in disgust. There's no way he's even touching it. And then, another one of the children throws down the poison chalice and dares him. The boy stands there nervously. He knows that he's not allowed to eat worms. That had been a lesson ingrained in him from a very young age. But his mother isn't here right now, and this thing doesn't look like any kind of worm that he's seen before. It almost looks a bit… tasty. In exchange for eating the worm, another one of the children promises he'll give him five English pounds. The kids around the circle gasp. 
that's a lot of money. None of them have even got two pounds on them, let alone five. Think of all the sweets you could buy with that kind of money. But the boy is adamant. He puffs his chest out, he stands up tall, and he nods firmly. Five pounds, or he wouldn't do it. After some intense schoolyard debate, the deal is sealed. As the boy lies in bed that night, staring at the ceiling and grumbling, he knows that he is not happy about what his friends have done to him today. He's going to get them back for this. Only he's getting a bit of a tummy ache. Getting is the wrong word. He's had a tummy ache for most of the evening. What he's experiencing now is heartburn. It feels as if something is crawling in his chest. The boy just ignores it. It's probably just his worries about the worm inside of him. He chewed it up pretty well. There's no way that it's still alive in him, surely. His uneasy sleep is punctuated by rotten dreams. Dreams in which he finds himself lying on the floor and his playground lying on the ground at school, unable to move as people gather around him to poke him with a stick. He feels his skin covered with maggots. They even crawl across the surface of his eyes. In his chest, there's a searing pain. The boy wakes with a start as he feels his heart pounding, thudding against his ribs. It's agonizing. Adrenaline courses through him as he sweats off his face. Crying out for his mom, the boy lies there in bed, feeling the heart attacking his system. When you decide to become a surgeon, you have to accept that you're not going to get very much sleep most nights. In fact, it's more than that. You have to not only accept that you won't get much sleep most nights, but you also have to be at your absolute best when you've had no sleep and it's the middle of the night. With over 40 years under his belt, the surgeon doesn't need coffee anymore, even when the junior doctor offers it to him as he strides toward the operating theater. Instead, he asks them to fill him in on the situation. Who's his patient? What's going on? What needs to be done? The doctor accompanying him reads the notes in a calm but hurried voice. They haven't got much time on this one at all. At any moment, the boy's heart could give out. The surgeon asks what's wrong with the organ, and the doctor looks at his notes in apparent confusion. Apparently, over the course of the night, the boy has suffered a 72% reduction in the mass of his heart. The surgeon stops just on the other side of the door. He doesn't want to have this conversation in front of his whole team. He whispers to the doctor in a terse voice, What kind of infection does this boy have that his heart has undergone that rapid of a deterioration? It's not an infection at all, sir. It's, well, sir, it's a worm. The doctor holds out a sheet to him. The surgeon takes it from him. He looks down at the x-ray to see a scan of the boy's chest cavity. It doesn't look so bad. There's a hole in the heart for sure, but the surgeon has encountered worse in his career. This was taken when the boy was first admitted. The doctor hands the surgeon a second x-ray. And this was taken just one hour later. It is barely recognizable as a human heart. There seems to be a mass growing in the cavity that was left by the heart. And there, infecting all of the boy's organs, was the shape of a worm. The biker weaves his way through the traffic down on Marylebone Road, eyes darting frantically in all directions. He may have a concussion, and he may not be allowed to drive at all right now. In fact, he knows he definitely isn't. But he is under strict instructions. This heart needs to get to St. Mary's Hospital before it's too late. The bike careens around the corner and skids to a halt outside the emergency doors. An ambulance team in front of him is trying to help an old lady out of the back of their vehicle, but the biker doesn't have time for them. He grabs the organ box from the back of the bike and races into the building. It takes all of his remaining concentration to navigate through the maze of hospital corridors on his way to the operating theater. On a better day, he'd be able to do this with no problem, but with his head injury, he can see the light starting to blur all around him. Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 7A, Ward 7B, he runs as fast as his heavy boots will allow him, feeling that energy draining from his system. He can't look at his watch, he can't check the time, he just has to find this boy operating theater. There, right up ahead of him, just a couple of hundred feet. There's a doctor waiting outside the door who looks up at the sound of his footsteps. The biker rips his helmet off and holds out the box with a heart in it, panting heavily. It's the moment of truth. Is he too late? The doctor looks shell-shocked, not at the biker's arrival, but clearly at something else she's just seen. The man starts to explain, but runs out of words, and instead beckons the biker to follow him into the observation room. There, the two of them stand looking through the glass at the little boy lying on the operating table with the surgeon standing over him. There's something in the air. The biker sniffs, confused. Can anyone else smell sugar? Next time you open a packet of candied worms, take a second to look through the little creepy crawlies in the bag. Perhaps poke a couple of them, just to see if any of them are moving. You can never be too careful. 
If you had told the parents of that young boy on the night when their son woke up with heart palpitations, telling stories of eating a worm at school, that the only health concerns he would have going forward were mild diabetes and a slightly raised level of blood sugar, I'm sure they would have been thrilled to hear it. You see, SCP-839, commonly referred to within the Foundation as candied worms, is much scarier on the surface than it is underneath. Not only does this SCP resemble your usual candy worm, but its body is actually composed of sugar flavorings and colorings, roughly equivalent to what you would find in most convenience store candy aisles. Each instance even has a small raised bit of writing near the tail specifying which flavor it is. While the origins of these worms are yet to be determined, cases have sprung up across much of the Western world, with higher numbers reported in areas with higher levels of diabetes. There seems to be a parallel between high-sugar diets and the presence of SCP-839. Whether they are of man-made or other origins is yet to be determined. That is not to say that SCP-839 cannot survive outside of human populations. This SCP in the wild primarily feeds on decomposing organic matter and is capable of sustaining itself on a purely vegetarian diet. However, when ingested into the human body, SCP-839 will target specific organs and burrow its way towards them. The organ in question depends on which color candied worm the SCP instance is. For example, the red cherry flavored candied worms will burrow towards the heart and consume that, while the blue raspberry ones will instead feed on the human's kidney. One would expect the health consequences of this feeding to be severe. However, as the SCP feeds, it will also change its own shape and chemical composition until the worm itself becomes a substitute organ for the one that it is consuming. However, this substitute organ is not a perfect replacement, as other health consequences are derived from its presence. For example, the green apple-flavored SCP-839-3 targets the eye and replaces it with a jelly-green version of the human eye. While this eye is mostly capable of sight, subjects have reported mild hallucinations and blurriness of vision, as well as a greenish tint to how they see the world. Fortunately for the Foundation, SCP-839 reproduces sexually, meaning that individual instances require a partner in order to have offspring. This has made containment of this SCP much more feasible. Though they are a relatively low-priority entity in the broader scope of the Foundation, there are no known cases as of yet of any SCP-839 infections leading to death or serious chronic illness. Therefore, any instances that are captured by the Foundation are sent to Storage Site 839-1, where they are kept in a glass housing and regularly fed a diet of plant matter each day. Here, their reproductive activity can be closely monitored and controlled based on what research is needed. Those infected with SCP-839 instances can continue to live long and healthy lives, with only minor health complications arising. Therefore, the Foundation is comfortable allowing a reasonable number of cases to go unexamined in the world. So, like I said, for next time you open up a bag of candied worms, maybe just give them a quick poke. You could be saving yourself a trip to the hospital and a lifetime dependence on insulin. It's a quiet morning in LEGO City, until the robbery begins. Clients of LEGO City's first national LEGO bank barely notice at first as men in dark suits with plastic, black masks covering their faces slink into the room from every conceivable entrance and exit. When these same ten sinister LEGO strangers all pull out guns, everyone pays close attention. This is a robbery, their leader says while firing his gun into the air. We don't want any heroes. If you try to disrupt our operation, we'll blow you into bricks. The patrons hit the ground, cowering for dear life as five of the masked robbers approach the tellers with open bags and the other five work crowd control, pointing their weapons at the cowering civilians. These men are hardened LEGO criminals. If something goes south, they won't hesitate to start blasting. Empty your vaults, lady, the leader says to one of the tellers. We ain't messing around. We'll ice everyone in here. But the teller doesn't follow his orders. Instead, she reaches under her desk and presses a tiny red button hidden from sight. Suddenly, the room erupts in red flashes and alarms as the bank's security system activates. Robbers and hostages alike feel themselves beginning to panic, but the leader, he stays cool and still. Less than ten seconds pass before the alarm stops, you can hear a pin drop in the room. Locks deactivate and shutters roll back up. The teller is confused and horrified. What happened? Little does she know, in a van parked outside, an eleventh member of the LEGO robbery team is working on a sophisticated computer setup. 
He's hacked into the bank's security system, and he's been able to both shut down the alarm system and intercept the message that goes out to the local police precinct. The plan is unfolding perfectly. Nice try, the leader says, and shoots the Lego teller dead. Everyone in the room, including the other Lego robbers, gasp. Nobody is prepared for things to get this ugly this quickly. Anyone feel like helping me out here? The leader says. Or am I going to need to start wasting more tellers? The surviving tellers read the message loud and clear. They open up the vaults and begin wheeling out stacks of Lego cash, which the robbers begin stuffing into containers and duffel bags. In total, they steal over two million Lego dollars. Each member of the team is going to get a hefty payout. With the mission completed, there's no sense in hanging around. They need to hop into their Lego getaway cars and be out of there before the Lego cops show up. But by the time they're leaving the bank, it's already too late. Lego cop cars are tearing down the street towards their parked getaway vehicles. It doesn't make sense. Their operation was perfectly planned, military in its precision. The whole thing had been over in less than three minutes. How are the cops on them already? But none of them have time to think. The cop cars screech to a halt, and armed officers start climbing out, training their guns on the gobsmacked team of Lego robbers standing in front of the bank. Freeze! Put down the weapons in the bags, or we'll be forced to take action! A Lego cop screams over a Lego megaphone. The only reply they get is gunfire. The leader levels his Lego gun and starts blasting, taking out two cops and forcing the rest to scramble for cover behind their vehicles. Taking advantage of the moment of opportunity, the robbers scatter like cockroaches under a newly lifted rock. Most make it to their cars, but in the confusion, the Lego police are able to return fire. One of the robbers, the tallest but slowest of the hardened criminal team, goes down in a hail of bullets. Another one of the robbers, who'd been his friend, screams in rage and turns his gun on the police, firing like a madman, not even caring if he hits his target. A conveniently placed police sniper in the building across from them wings him with an expert shoulder shot that drops him to the ground, alive but too injured to escape. He's nothing but dead weight now. The remaining eight robbers pile into three Lego getaway vehicles, two classic cars manned by getaway drivers, and the van where the team's elite Lego hacker had been doing his high-tech work. Now, their job is a lot more simple. Get out of here without getting caught or killed. Immediately, the chase spills out onto the streets. They'd planned for this possibility. After completing the job, they'd each head to three different pre-designated safe zones, so if one was followed, they wouldn't implicate the others. The plan is complicated by seemingly having every single one of the city's cops on their tail now. Contact between the three vehicles immediately breaks down. The leader of the robbers is in the fastest of the getaway cars, with three others, the driver, the rookie, and the old-timer. Behind them, scores of Lego police cars surge through the streets. Armed officers hang out of the passenger doors, opening fire on their escape vehicle, hoping to hit them or at least pop the tires. We want to play rough, huh? The leader says to his panicking fellow criminals. We'll show them how to play rough. The leader and the old-timer grab a pair of Lego submachine guns that are lying across the floor of the car. They lock and load before leaning out of the car windows to return fire. If they're going to go down today, it's going to be in a blaze of glory, not bruised and humiliated in a holding cell. You'll never take us alive, coppers! The old-timer barks as he and the leader open fire on their pursuers. It's a parabolic hellstorm, skittering bullets across the hoods of the police cars behind them. The windshields of even Lego police cars are reinforced to take this kind of punishment, but not for long. Soon enough, the surge of cars is buckling under the weight of fire from the leader and the old-timer. Cars are crashing into each other and piling up as the criminals take off. What should have been a simple robbery is quickly spiraling into a nightmare for all involved. The death toll is already in the double digits, and the chase goes on, with frequent gunfire exchanged between the Lego robbers and their Lego boys in blue pursuers. Above all this, above the chase, above the gunfire, above the robbery, two almost godlike giants stare down on the whole chaotic display. These godlike giants are, in fact, a pair of young boys aged eight and nine. Less than an hour ago, these boys were just bored kids who'd run out of games to play on their Xbox. They had decided to go a little retro and switch up the Minecraft for a classic box of Lego. One of the two young boys remarked, I think my dad has a big red box of Lego in his office. He probably won't mind if we use it. Of course, what the boy didn't know was that his father wasn't, contrary to his own belief, an accountant who worked in the city. He was actually a mid-level researcher working with the SCP Foundation, and quite the workaholic at that. He had a tendency to bring his work home with him, metaphorically, and in the case of some safe-class SCPs, when given the proper clearances, literally. 
One such SCP was SCP-387, the living Lego, a toy that genuinely has a mind of its own. While completely inert and seemingly normal inside their red box, when removed and even partially constructed, the Lego comes to life and begins playing out its roles, from planes to tanks to hospitals to war zones. And these Lego creations are extremely committed to their parts. After finding the box, the young boys did what all children do when they happen upon a box full of Lego. They started building, and thanks to their vast juvenile imaginations, it didn't take long for them to construct an impressive Lego city in the living room. But a standard city full of Lego running smoothly is no fun. The boys needed to introduce a little extra excitement to the proceedings, like, say, a team of bank robbers. The one thing the two young boys don't expect is for the bank robbers, when introduced to the city, to start independently planning and executing a heist on the city's biggest bank. Still, there are worse ways to kill a rainy Sunday. Back on the ground of the Lego City, the other getaway vehicles are running into trouble. The other car had initially managed to pull ahead from the police, but while trying to cross a bridge, it runs into an unexpected roadblock. Literally, the Lego police have built a roadblock on the other side of the bridge, and now it's too late to reverse. Open fire! An enraged Lego police captain yells to his assembled squadron behind the barricades, and they raise the guns and do so. Lego bullets pepper the getaway car. They can't drive through the barricade. All they can do is make a sharp left turn and hope to avoid the onslaught. Instead, they smash through the Lego barricade and tumble off the bridge. The car sails into the freezing Lego river, where the sudden cold paralyzes the robbers and the getaway driver inside. They go into shock and drown moments later. Across the Lego city, the van containing the hacker, the getaway driver, and another robber had somehow blended in with the traffic and has managed to escape the relentless police chase. Everyone inside the van breathes a sigh of relief, knowing they've already done better than most of their fellow criminals tonight. If they manage to make it through, there will be much to celebrate. For them, the next stage of the mission is clear. They need to make their way to a warehouse in the industrial district, their designated drop-off area, where they could hide their stolen money and disappear like leaves in the wind. They've already been through the hard parts, the planning, the robbery itself, the shootout, and car chase with the police. They're out of the woods now. Or so they thought. When they arrive at the warehouse and drive inside, parking their van, they immediately realize that something is off. But by now, it's too late to do anything about it. They suddenly hear footsteps and the screech of tires as heavy police tactical vehicles squeal into the warehouse all around them, boxing them in. LEGO SWAT team operatives climb out of each vehicle and train their weapons on the trapped van. One of them yells, We have you surrounded! There's no way out! Drop your weapons and surrender if you want to walk out of here alive! And so, with no other options, this is exactly what they do. When they exit the vehicle with their hands behind their heads, the LEGO SWAT team tackles them and claps cuffs around their wrists. They'll likely be spending the rest of their lives in jail for this fiasco, but at least they get to live. Across the city, only four members of the robbery team remain alive and free. The leader, the old-timer, the rookie, and the remaining getaway driver, all of whom narrowly managed to escape the extensive police detail following them. It had been a mix of skill and blind luck. The leader knows that one thing about this whole situation has nothing to do with luck. With all the planning they'd been doing and the disabling of the bank's security system, how had the police been on them so fast? There's only one logical answer. They'd been set up. One member of the team was secretly working with the LEGO City Police, and they'd sold the rest of them down the river. The leader doesn't know who specifically ruined this entire operation like that, but he intends to find out, and when he does, he's going to make them pay dearly for their betrayal. But for now, he stays quiet. He doesn't want to show all his cards before they made their way to the safe house, if it was even safe anymore. Still, they'll deal with that problem when they get to it. After a tense ten minutes of silent driving, they reach the planned rendezvous point, another warehouse in the city docks, built against the section of blue carpet that the young boys who made this world intended to represent the ocean. Here, they'd wait for a speedboat chartered by their employers to pick them up and their ill-gotten gains, if they survive that long. The getaway driver parks the car out of view in the abandoned Oceanside warehouse, and the criminals inside pile out, breathing carefully and stretching their little Lego legs. There's tension in the air, and of course, it's the leader who breaks the silence. Someone here hasn't been entirely honest with us, he says, taking out his Lego handgun. There's no way the cops could get on us that quickly if they hadn't been given some kind of tip. Another grim silence falls over the room, 
The old-timer, the rookie, and the getaway driver share a suspicious glance. Who among them could be the imposter? The daring escape they'd managed to perform no longer gives them comfort. The millions of dollars in the trunk of their little Lego car may still be forfeit if one of the people in this warehouse is a police informant. The silence is once again broken by the leader, who raises his weapon and shoots the getaway driver dead. The rookie and the old-timer are horrified by the seemingly callous and random display of violence. What's wrong with you? The old-timer barks. The rookie chimes in with, What made you think he was the mole? The leader just laughs, his weapon is still raised, its barrel drifting back and forth between the old-timer and the rookie. His indifference to violence frightens them. He seems unpredictable and dangerous. No reason, the leader says. He'd already done his job. We don't need a getaway driver anymore. And getting rid of him narrows down my options. Which one of you squealed on us? The rookie pulls out his own gun and aims it at the leader. The old-timer follows suit, not wanting to be left out. They now have a full-on Mexican standoff on their hands. Only the leader seems unfazed. The rookie says, If what you say about there being a squealer is true, how would you know it'd be one of us, not someone from the other teams? The leader shrugs. I can't know for sure, but I'm not going to take any chances. He levels the gun at the rookie and prepares to fire, when suddenly, a nearby window shatters. It's the police. Their little internal dispute would have to wait if they wanted to keep a single Lego cent of the money they'd stolen. Heavily armed Lego police officers bust open the door with a battering ram, while others climb through the windows. It's another classic ambush. The leader and the old-timer turn their guns towards the invading Lego cops and start firing wildly, shooting some and scaring away others as they run towards the car. They can't escape here without the money. If they don't bring the money, then all this chaos was for nothing. The leader runs across the warehouse, narrowly dodging the hail of Lego bullets firing all around him, and skids to a stop behind the getaway car. Even with gunshots ringing out from every direction, the leader keeps his cool and reaches into the car. He manages to find the largest duffel bag and slings it over his shoulder. Even if he doesn't get all of the money, he can run away with most of it when that chartered speedboat arrives. Nobody involved in this even notices when the roof lifts entirely off of the warehouse. The two huge young boys stare in from above, curious about where the story is heading down below. They're here just in time to see the tense shootout continue as the desperate leader pops out from his cover and returns fire against the advancing line of police. The old-timer tries his best to hold his own, holding a gun in each hand and firing wildly, but his recklessness soon catches up with him. Outnumbered, the cops with Lego shotguns and assault rifles unload on him, leaving him every bit as dead as the getaway driver. Ducking away to avoid the same fate, the leader notices something. The rookie is nowhere to be seen. Not dead, just gone. He knew it. Of course the rookie had been the mole all along. He should never have trusted the little creep. It had been a perfect plan, and he'd ruined everything. Over the din of gunfire, the leader hears something else. A boat motor. It's the chartered speedboat, his ticket out of this nightmare of bullets and broken promises. He might win after all. He turns and sees the speedboat entering the submerged part of the warehouse, just out of view of the police strike force. It would be a risky move, but he knows he can make it. He doesn't have any choice. Throwing caution to the wind, the leader turns and runs towards the boat, dodging every bullet that the police fire at him. He's doing it. He's doing it. He jumps into the boat, and the boat takes off, speeding away from the warehouse. He laughs in crazed relief, still lugging the duffel bag full of money off his aching shoulder. He's out. He's home free. Until a giant hand from above descends and grabs his Lego boat. He's lifted up and thrown back into the red box he was originally taken from, while the two young boys start taking apart the rest of the Lego city and tidying it back into the box too. My dad'll be home soon, one of the young boys says. You better clean up before he's back. The switchblade's knife glints in the dark, and the bully holding it runs through the arcade, screaming in terror. The kid watches, shocked by the insanity unfolding, as twenty tiny vicious gorillas chase the knife-wielding bully as tears streak his face. This situation defies all explanation, unless you know about SCP-3092. Let's go back to the beginning. The kid almost trips over his laces as his chucks hammer against the sidewalk. The headphones for his Walkman bounce against his neck as the wind rushes past. Heaving in as much air as he can, the kid runs through town, looking desperately this way and that for any grown-ups he recognizes. No one. Just strangers with thick mustaches and perms chatting outside Blockbuster and Walden books, totally oblivious to the fact that he's running for his life. The kid cocks an ear, and sure enough, he hears that all-too-familiar rolling, clattering sound coming after him. The skateboards are catching up. 
A few insults catch on the wind and float across to him. Four eyes, earthworm, and a good few names that he doesn't want to repeat. Apparently, their town used to have a good Native American community, that's why his parents had moved here. But nowadays, it seems to just be white faces all around him. From what the bullies are shouting as they chase him, and the total apathy of the grown-ups on the sidewalks at the words, it's no wonder everyone else moved away. A rock hits the back of his head, almost knocking his glasses off. The sound of the tiny wheels roars louder and louder with every block. He needs to find an escape, and fast. Home's way too far away. His parents aren't expecting him home until nightfall. He needs a spot to lay low. The arcade? It's closed today, but the owner told him where the spare key is. He could go there, but he needs to lose them first. His lungs are burning, and his legs are starting to give up on him. Ice! The kid sees it too late and steps straight onto a patch of it. His converse slides out from under him and flings his limbs this way and that, trying desperately to stay on his feet as he skids across the ice. His momentum throws him forward, and he sticks out another foot, catching himself back on the sidewalk. Perfect. He turns just in time to see the four bullies on their skateboards hitting the patch and going flying. They land in a heap together, groaning and scuffling, trying to get back up. Now's his chance. The kid shoots off down an alleyway, loops back around the block, turns up a side street, and arrives at the arcade without having looked back once. He snatches the key from under the gutter and looks around the quiet street. Nobody there, thank goodness. He darts through the door and locks it behind him with trembling fingers. Tears flood his eyes as he lets his forehead rest against the door. Every day, every damn day, it's more of the same. Why can't he just have some peace? Why can't he just be normal? The kid stands there crying for a long time. He can't tell his parents what's going on. They've got enough of their own problems. He tried to tell his teachers, but at lunch, he overheard them laughing and joking about it all between themselves. It just sometimes feels like no one's on his side. The kid takes a deep breath and rubs the moisture out of his eyes. That's enough. If he keeps thinking about it all day, it's only going to feel worse. He's on his own now. He's safe. What he needs to do is just enjoy the little bit of peace he has now before it all starts again. And what better place to be laying low than the arcade? He hits the lights. Pinball, claw machines, and arcade cabinets all light up and start playing over one another. Air hockey, basketball hoops, and foosball all beep at him invitingly. He can't help but let a smile spread across his face. He walks across the carpet looking this way and that at Frogger, Pac-Man, Galaga, Donkey Kong. So many choices, so many choices. He hops on the counter and hits the side of the cash register. It pops open, revealing trays stacked full of quarters. Mr. Burns, the guy who owns the place, told him he's allowed to let himself in and use the money in the register to play whenever he wants, on the house. As the kid scoops a handful out of the drawer, he realizes he might not be totally on his own in this town after all. Pac-Man beeps into life as soon as the quarters fall into the slot. He grabs the joystick and stares intently at the screen, darting this way and that through the maze, munching, munching, munching. Try as they might, the four ghosts just can't catch him. The kid grins. All that time running from four bullies wasn't quite for nothing, was it? But after a couple of levels, he gets bored. He always plays Pac-Man, so much so that he's memorized his route through the first few levels. Kinda takes the fun out of things a bit. He lets the ghosts around him and watches Pac-Man swirl away into nothing. Frogger isn't much better. He never really clicked with this one for some reason, just felt too stop-start. He lets the frog get run over and stands back, letting out a sigh. Is there anything in here he hasn't touched yet? Wait, what's that? In the corner of the room, there's a new machine, still half covered in a sheet. It hasn't even been plugged into the wall yet. The kid skips over to it and bends down to hook it up. There. He stands back, takes hold of the sheet, and pulls as dramatically as he can. It billows and unfurls to reveal… a claw machine. Oh. It's just another claw machine. Black Tie Toys is written on the side in classic 80s lettering, just under two meters tall or so. Nothing to make it stand out from the other cabinets in here. But not only does it look boring, it doesn't have anything he wants inside. Just a bunch of plushy gorillas. Not exactly a brand new cabinet, but worth a shot anyway. The kid slots a coin in and cracks his knuckles. Here goes nothing. The claw swings to life at the slightest touch of the joystick. These things are normally rigged, so he's not exactly expecting much from it. May as well just drop the claw here. All the toys in this one are the same anyway. No way. It's caught onto one of the gorilla's feet, lifting the toy up as it dangles upside down. It swings precariously this way and that as the claw guides it over to the hole. 
It's a defective toy with a bit of stitching loose on its shoulder, but he couldn't care less. The thrill of getting one first time, it's... The toy drops into the chute and thumps to the bottom, just behind the little door. The kid punches the air and yells in triumph. He did it, first try. He bends down and reaches out into the little flap, just as the flap opens by itself. He freezes as a little toy gorilla opens the door for himself and hops out onto the carpet. The kid yelps and jumps backwards, tripping over his feet. Somewhere in that chute, between falling in and popping out, this little toy had, well, it had come alive. The little gorilla does the same as the kid, leaping backwards defensively. It raises two soft fists with surprisingly dexterous fingers and looks the kid up and down warily. It orders the kid in a stern militaristic voice to identify himself. The kid's jaw drops open. It can speak? The little plushy gorilla's voice is gruff but high-pitched enough to match his size. He barely comes up to the kid's knee. The gorilla asks him if he's friendly. The kid nods quickly. The gorilla's eyes narrow. What's your favorite fruit? The gorilla asks. Uh, bananas. Phew, the gorilla says, dropping his fists. You never can be too careful. The kid dusts himself off and climbs to his feet. The gorilla deftly scales the side of the claw machine and hangs off it, surveying the arcade. The kid asks his name, which seems to stump the little toy. It picks at the loose stitching on his shoulder. The kid suggests calling him Stitches. The gorilla salutes at the sound of his new name. All right, kid, what's the operation? Give me the sit rep. Operation? Sit rep? The kid stands there, nonplussed for a moment. Well, they're in an arcade. Stitches nods sagely, taking the intel on board. And they have to stay here until nightfall. The little gorilla has already swung himself up on top of the machine to get a better view of strategic locations. And where are the hostiles? The kid hesitates. Stitches looks down at him knowingly. An unspoken understanding passes between them. They could be attacked at any moment. The pair of them take a walk around the room. The kid explaining the situation. Four bullies, three entrances, front door, alley door, and a window. No back rooms or hallways, those are all locked. The gorilla takes a candy cane from behind the counter and sticks it in the side of his mouth like a cigar. He doesn't seem to be able to chew it or even suck on it, he is just a toy after all. But the kid feels like he can't really point that out. He has no idea how fragile his comrade's ego is. Look, I can't actually taste it, okay? I can only see, hear, and touch. I'm insecure about it, leave me alone. We haven't got much time anyway. The gorilla says, we've got to prepare our defenses. The two of them go to work, Stitches barking orders at the kid as they ready themselves for the bully's arrival. The kid asks Stitches what exactly their aim is. The plushie looks at the kid like it's a trick question. Total domination, absolute victory, annihilation, a butchering. The kid straightens, suddenly feeling very unsure about all of this. He tells Stitches that he doesn't want to kill anyone or anything like that. Kill? The little gorilla falls backwards off the coin machine in surprise. Kill? No, 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 no. What's wrong with you? Of course not. We're gonna tickle, bamboozle, inconvenience, and bonk. Where those things fit within the confines of the Geneva Convention, of course. Bang, bang, bang. The hammering fists on the door are so loud that it shakes on its hinges. They've barely had 10 minutes to get ready. That's not fair. The kid can see the shadows of feet blocking the streetlight. His knees go weak almost straight away at the sound of their cat calling through the cracks. They've found him. He could make a break for the alley door. If he's quiet enough, he could... But it's too late. As he looks at the fire escape, he can see another pair of legs blocking his exit. No point jumping out of the window, they'd see him straight away and have him blocked off from both sides. He looks down at his squishy little companion. They have no choice. It's time for guerrilla warfare. The front door crashes open, splinters of wood flying everywhere, and three of the bullies storm in. Front and center is their ringleader, dressed in all-black skater clothes with a constant sneer on his face. He must easily be a good foot taller than the kid, but even he looks small standing in between the twins, hulking egg-shaped boys with no hair on their heads or glints in their eyes. The banging noise behind the kid tells him that the fourth bully is trying to kick his way through the alley door. They don't have time to deal with that now. The twins are storming over to him like a pair of freight trains. His legs are really shaking now. He needs to move, but... Stitches is gone. That loyal gorilla had been at his side just a moment ago. But as soon as trouble arrived, he disappeared. Just like they always do. The twins are nearly upon him now. The kid doesn't have a choice. He takes a deep breath and closes his eyes, ready for a beating. The, uh... the primal scream fills the arcade. Out of the rafters, a tiny toy gorilla swings down on a loose cable, heading straight for the twins' faces. The round faces barely have time to go from angry to confused 
before the cuddly toy is on top of them, pummeling them with its soft fists. Turns out those fists aren't worth much in a fight. Twin One pulls the ape off his face and holds it at arm's length. Two of them stare at Stitches, who's swinging his fists wildly through thin air. Apparently lacking the brain power to be stunned that an inanimate cuddly toy has gained sentience, Twin One tosses Stitches over the arcade cabinets, and the pair of them continue their advance. Except the distraction worked just long enough. The kid grins and runs around the cotton candy machine, which by now is rumbling and banging, letting out a thin plume of smoke. His smile falters as they close in on him. Any second now. But the twins are closing in on him, thick arms outstretched to grab him when… bang! The cotton candy machine explodes. Hot sugary webbing bursts out in all directions, wrapping around the bullies and missing the top of the kid's ducking head by less than an inch. He can't believe that actually worked. Taking a step back to survey the damage, he looks down at the enormous twins, bound up in cotton candy and arguing with each other. The alley door crashes open, and the fourth bully rushes in. He's skinny, with tattoos all down both his arms. Looking at him now up close, the kid reckons he must be a good ten years older than the other bullies. Why he's still hanging out with high school kids is anyone's guess. The kid gulps. He's only got one more trick up his sleeve, but two bullies left to go. The ringleaders disappeared somewhere. He can't worry about that now, though. He just has to focus on the old one. The man is leering at him from the back of the arcade. He reaches round to his back pocket and pulls out something small and shiny. Flicking open the knife blade, he spins the blade around between his fingers and winks at the kid. He feels all the blood leave his face. This isn't a game anymore. He needs to get out of here. The kid makes a break for it, running towards the open front doors, but in a flash, the old bully is in front of him, playing with the knife and smiling that same sinister smile. He tries to run back the other way, to the alley door, but the bully is blocking him again, before he can even take a few steps. How is he that fast? Be calm, be calm, think. The kid reaches into his pocket. Here goes nothing. He turns to run back to the front doors, but this time throws the pinballs all across the carpet. For a second, it looks like it hasn't worked. The old bully steps in the gaps between the pinballs. He looks down to see them all there scattered around in front of him, but too late. His foot is already landing on about five metal balls that all shoot out from under him. He goes flying, crashing right into a Galaga machine head first. His leg twitches a couple times, and he goes still. The knife flies out of his hand, arcing through the air, spinning round and round and round, before landing with a gentle thud on the soft carpet. A sneaker treads onto the handle, a sneaker attached to a hairy leg sticking out of a pair of cord pants. The ringleader bends over to pick up the blade, flicks it open, and holds it against the neck of the little gorilla clutched in his arms. It would almost look funny, the bully threatening a cuddly toy, if the toy wasn't writhing around in fear. The kid cries out in panic for the knife-wielding bully to put his plush gorilla friend down. He's got nothing left, no more tricks up his sleeve. It's over. The bully just grins maniacally at him and pushes the knife harder against the squishy neck. He's got stitches by the shoulder of his arm, just above where the stitching is coming loose. The bully's back is to the cash register. On the wall behind him, dozens of giant cuddly prizes hang lifeless. The bully hisses that the kid is going to pay for making them run all over town. The kid nods his head. He will, he promises. They can beat him up or whatever they like, just don't hurt stitches. The bully laughs at the gorilla's name. You gave him a name? You're such a loser. Couldn't come up with anything better than Stitches. What does that name even mean? Let me show you. The gorilla yells. Twisting away from the blade, he reaches into the gap in his shoulder, crying out in pain, and pulls out handfuls of stuffing, throwing them up into the bully's face. It doesn't do much, but it's enough to distract him. The kid seizes his chance, dashing forward and shoving the bully square in the chest, knocking him backwards and freeing Stitches. The little gorilla runs off to safety straight away. The kid can hardly believe what he's seeing. The bully is getting to his feet now, knife still in hand, snarling. But almost immediately, his snarling is drowned out by the sound of a shrieking primate, then another one. Both kid and bully wheel round to see Stitches swinging across the wall of stuffed toys giving them high fives. As soon as he touches each of them, they transform, falling and turning into crazed gorillas, all of them rushing straight at the bully. His eyes widen in terror. He turns on his heel and runs out through the open doors, pursued by a small army. He lashes out wildly as he goes, striking one of the gorillas down. Stitches and the kid chase him to the doorway and watch as the little toy gorillas chase the bully off into the night, swinging on lampposts and leaping over cars. Good thing he ran. Stitches climbs up onto the kid's shoulder, popping his candy cane cigar back into his mouth. Our fists are about as hard as Hello Kitty's. 
Let's see how long it takes them to figure that one out. A whimper behind them sobers the moment. Turning around, they see the body of the gorilla toy that the bully punched as he left. It lies slumped on a pinball machine, stuffing bursting from its chest. Plumes of cotton cover the glass. Stitches buries his head in the kid's neck, sickened and devastated by the casualty. The dying gorilla looks at him with beady little eyes. It raises a dramatic hand towards him, breathing in shaky gasps. Uh, Mr. Stitches, I don't feel so good. Like a community theater actor doing Shakespeare, the little toy dies a dramatic death. Throwing his head back, he takes one desperate gasping breath and falls still. The kid stands there in shock, except the little gorilla does seem to be breathing, very lightly, as if pretending he's dead. The kid sidles up to the cabinet and pokes him. Hello? He pokes the gorilla again. It opens one eye and looks at him, annoyed. I'm out of the game. Leave me alone. Stitches hits the kid on the side of the head. Hey, let him be out of the game in peace. Show some respect. Uh, Sorry. The kid clasps his hands together in humility and stands by the pretend dying gorilla. Stitches salutes. Until they get bored and go off to play a game of Galaga. Ouch. The boy on the bus turns around. Did someone pull out one of his hairs? He looks around but the girl in the seat behind him is staring out the window. She's so quiet and always keeps to herself, he doesn't think it possibly could have been her. The boy turns back around, wondering if he just imagined it, unable to see the small smile forming on the girl's face. The bus stops, and the girl practically sprints off and up the sidewalk to her house. She runs past her mother without saying hello and goes straight into her bedroom, closing and locking the door behind her. She sits at her desk, opens a drawer, and pulls out a small bag. She reaches into the bag and takes out a folded piece of paper. Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker. Do you love someone but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move, their every word. The girl imagines herself watching a tiny version of the boy on the bus right here on her desk seeing everything that he does, listening to his secret thoughts and desires. If only she knew him better, then she'd have the confidence to talk to him and could get him to like her as much as she liked him. She reaches into the bag and pulls out the naughty stalker. It doesn't look like much, just a little doll made from a woven and twisted length of red string. She looks back to the instructions. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string in our naughty stalker, and see what you've been missing. The girl reaches into her pocket and takes out a single strand of hair. She holds the hair up to the light, looking at it. If this works, it will mean all of her dreams coming true. Just like the instructions said to do, she takes the hair and slides it under a string on the doll's body. She sets the doll down on her desk and waits. And waits. And… nothing happens. She picks up the instructions again, turning them over, but there's nothing else except… Another wonderful product brought to you by blah blah blah. Where were the rest of the instructions on how to get it to work? Why wasn't the doll coming to life? What a piece of junk. What a… wait. What was that? The girl leans in close. Is the doll… breathing? She's startled as the doll turns its head over its shoulder, seemingly looking right at her, or rather, right through her. Coming, mom! The doll shouts before standing up. It starts to walk in place, looking like it is opening invisible doors, and then sitting down on a chair that she can't see. It looks like it's pretending to eat dinner. The girl's eyes widen. The doll is alive. It's really alive. It's actually showing what the boy is doing right now. The naughty stalker has worked. The girl is fascinated by watching the little doll that gives her a peek into her crush's life. She skips her own dinner so she can watch him finish his. She watches as he sits, probably watching TV, takes a shower, and gets ready for bed. It may all just be a little doll acting it out, but it feels like she is there with him. She watches the doll sleep for hours before falling finally asleep herself, her head resting on the desk next to him. The next morning, she passes by the boy and his friend sitting together on the bus and goes to the very back. She gets as low in the seat as she can so no one can see her and takes out the doll, holding it up to her ear. She listens to one side of the conversation as the boy talks about the action movie he watched last night, Weapon of Mass Extinction. The boy talks about how much he liked it, 
and how it's his new favorite movie. This was perfect. It's exactly what she needed. The next day in school, as the boy is putting things into his locker, the girl approaches. She pretends to trip and drops her books in front of him, the books scattering on the floor in front of him. The boy helps her pick them up and notices the DVD she dropped, Weapons of Mass Extinction. She explains that she brought her favorite movie to school to loan it to a friend. What a coincidence that they both happen to love the same film. The boy and the girl, bonding over their love of low-budget sci-fi action films, start spending more and more time together. No one has ever understood him the way that she does. It's as if she has known him for years, even though they've only been friends for a few days. Things move quickly though, and before long, he realizes that he is having romantic feelings for the girl. This is all the girl had ever wanted, and it's all thanks to the naughty stalker. Things are going so well, in fact, that she imagines she won't even need it much longer. But then, something strange happens. She is sure she heard the boy tell his friend that he loved baseball, but when she brings up the idea of going to a game together, the boy looks at her like she was crazy. He hated baseball. After that, things seem to change. The boy is still so nice when they are together. Now it sounds like he is talking about her behind her back. She worries that she has been wrong this whole time, that he has just been messing with her. This stupid doll isn't making her dreams come true. It's making her life a nightmare. But wait, who is the boy talking to? She leans in close to listen. Is he with another girl? Listening to one side of the conversation, she hears the boy tell someone that this is all just a big joke, a prank he is pulling on some dumb girl. Are they? No, they can't be. Kissing? The girl is in a white-hot rage. She can't believe he would do this to her, after she was nothing but perfect to him. She throws the doll across her room. She's going to confront the boy and whoever he's with. She'll teach him a lesson. She'll teach both of them a lesson. It's starting to rain as the girl gets her bike out and starts to ride to where she knows he is, the spot that was supposed to be their own special place. Cars pass close by on the narrow road, splashing her with water, but she doesn't care. She finally reaches the picnic spot where he took her just a few days ago, and she sees a car parked nearby. It must belong to the evil seductress he is with. The girl glares at the car. She grits her teeth until they feel like they might crack. Her fists are clenched so tight that she can't tell if it's the rain or blood from her fingernails digging in that she feels running down her palms. But she doesn't care. She's going to show both of them what happens when you break someone's heart. She takes a step towards the car and... The car that struck her slams on its brakes. The driver gets out and rushes towards her. It's the boy. Her boy. The older couple who are stopped on the side of the road with a flat tire run over to help. The boy gets down next to her and cradles her head in his lap, and they have one last moment to look into each other's eyes before the light fades from hers. Unfortunately for all involved, their lives would never be the same. But how could they have known that they were the victims of an encounter with an anomaly that, while small, is extremely dangerous? One that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-693, the Naughty Stalker. SCP-693 are multiple humanoid-shaped dolls, measuring roughly 18 centimeters in length, each made from a single string that is either red, blue, yellow, or black, with onyx beads for eyes. Their clothing will vary in color and style, and seems to have no bearing on the properties of the doll. The string doll will behave exactly as one would expect, showing no anomalous properties at all, until the owner takes the steps that are spelled out in the instructions that always accompany SCP-693. The instruction sheet congratulates the owner on their acquisition of a naughty stalker and explains that in order to use it, a single hair from another person must be inserted into a loop of its string, at which point the doll will attune to that person. The doll will then come alive, mimicking the actions of the hair's owner in real time, including their speech. The doll will perfectly portray the attuned individual for nine days, after which point it will become unreliable. The exact way in which SCP-693 begins changing the speech and actions depends on the color of its base string, but in all cases, its end goal is to drive the current owner of the doll to their death. SCP-693 goes about this by feeding inaccurate information to the owner. Dolls made of red string try to send their owner into increasingly violent fits of rage. Dolls comprised of blue string try to depress the owner and lead them to self-harm. Yellow dolls want to make their owners attempt unwanted acts of physical love, 
and black dolls encourage their owners to engage in activities and place themselves in situations that are dangerous. Interestingly, SCP-693 will attune not just to the living, but to the deceased as well. When a dead person's hair is placed in a loop of string, the naughty stalker will come to life, just as it does when a living person's is used. But instead of acting out the speech and movements of the person, the attuned doll will claim to be the deceased person and offer to act as a spiritual guide to the owner. But just like with a living person, at the nine-day mark, SCP-693 will become unreliable and will attempt to lead the owner down a path that results in their death. Once an SCP-693 instance is successful in causing its owner's death, a new doll instance will appear and be found on the owner's body. Several of these dolls have been recovered from Naughty Stalker victims, and currently, the Foundation has seven red instances, ten blue instances, five yellow instances, and one black instance in its possession. All instances of SCP-693 contained by the Foundation were originally classified as safe and kept in Containment Locker 12C-K, but following the events of Incident 693-E, that classification was revisited. During this incident, a researcher returned a Naughty Stalker doll to its Containment Locker, but in a lapse of judgment that went against Foundation protocols, they forgot to remove the hair that had been placed in the doll. When the locker was next opened, the dolls were observed to have all been moved. They were found in a circle around the accidentally still attuned doll, which had been crucified upside down on the wall of the locker. It is unknown where the dolls acquired nails. After this incident, a camera was placed inside of the locker, and the results were… surprising, to say the least. It turns out that SCP-693 instances come to life when they are not observed, even when they aren't attuned. While they have not yet been observed engaging in violent acts against each other, the camera has captured the naughty stalkers appearing to reenact the final 30 minutes of their last owner's life over and over. Following this new information, all instances of naughty stalker dolls were moved to their own separate 25 by 25 by 25 centimeter steel containers within the containment locker, and their classification was upgraded to Euclid. SCP-693 is one of the rare anomalies where the Foundation actually has quite a good idea as to where it originates, and it was very easy to discover as well. Provided that they aren't a deception, the instructions that appear with each instance of SCP-693 are quite explicit about where they come from. After congratulating the owner on their acquisition and explaining how the doll works, the instructions close by extolling the naughty stalker as yet another wonderful product brought to you by the factory. For those unaware, the factory is a place with a long connection to the Foundation, though the details on that will have to wait for another file exploration. All you need to know now is that the factory produces a huge amount of anomalies, and it appears that SCP-693 is one of them. There are theories that the dolls may have been produced as an espionage tool, but as for why their primary purpose seems to be driving their owner to their death, well that, we simply don't know. The young man watches as the lily-white coffin is lowered into the ground. He's surprised at the dryness of his eyes, seeing as it's his own mother being buried. But now isn't the time for questions. When the dirt is piled on and the small service comes to an end, the young man is the last to leave. Other than the eulogy, he never says a single word to anyone. She'd been difficult towards the end. He'd cared for his mother until her disease had made it so that she wasn't really his mother anymore. And then for another two years after that, things had been said and done that he wished he could remove from his memories of her, but the past is forever set. As he looks up from his mother's gravestone, he notices something strange in the distance, perhaps 30 feet away from him. A little girl, maybe about 10 years old, in a school uniform, standing behind another gravestone, She's wearing a worn-looking plastic pig mask and carrying a dirty rag doll. The young man stares into the dark eye holes of her mask for a moment, wondering if he's really seeing this or if she's a figment of his imagination brought on by stress and grief. Then he blinks and she's gone. For a second, he feels a frightening sentence looping through the dark recesses of his mind. You're starting to lose it already. A few years ahead of schedule, you'd make your mother proud. The young man shakes his head and leaves for home. Of course he might see things on a day like this. The mind does funny things when it's in a state of extreme emotional distress. It was perfectly natural that he'd see strange things on a day like this. But that little girl in the pig mask really did look real. Arriving home is a surreal experience. It's the first time in a long time that he's truly felt alone, 
like a child lost in a vast and unfamiliar space. Something about it just felt wrong. He makes himself a microwave meal and eats it silently in the kitchen. The place is so quiet, no panicked yells or cries of pain. He sighs and looks out the kitchen window as he washes the dishes and, in the distance, he sees another strange sight. A young boy, 12 years old or so, standing out in the cold, dark woods next to his house. He's wearing only swimming trunks. Swimming trunks and a worn-looking plastic mouse mask. A rag doll hangs limply from his thin, pale arm, just like the one the girl in the graveyard was holding. The young man's first instinct is to go out and help the child. After all, it's a cold night. He could catch his death out there. But with another blink, the child is gone. Just trees in the dark. He breathes a ragged sigh and takes an aspirin. Something must really be wrong with him if he keeps seeing strange children with animal faces out there. He trudges upstairs, hoping that maybe he'll get some sleep tonight and feel a little better in the morning. Shadows dart in the corners of his eyes, but he pays them no mind. He can't trust anything he sees today. He pauses for a moment in front of the room where his mother used to sleep. It looks cavernous without her tiny form nestled in the bed. He thinks about how she'd last been in that same room a little more than a week earlier. He sighs, turns off the light, and goes to bed. That night, the young man has strange dreams. He feels like a tiny fish at the deepest, darkest point of the ocean, watching huge black shapes loom and shift around him. He's afraid. He feels like he's being watched. The sudden spike of terror jolts him out of his sleep, and that's when he sees them. The children in the animal masks, seven of them now. They stand around his bed, hand in hand, like they're playing some kind of game, but in dead silence. Each one has a rag doll sitting patiently at their feet. Logically, he should be more afraid upon seeing them. It's the strangest experience of his life. And yet, he feels an odd sense of empty calm settle over him, like a warm blanket. His eyes close, and sleep takes him again. When the young man wakes up the next morning, something doesn't feel right. He's already dismissed the strange children with the animal masks and the dolls as a figment of his imagination, a half-waking dream. But what he can't dismiss is the numbness in his fingers and toes. It's like he'd spent all night sleeping in the cold outside, despite his room being perfectly warm. Perhaps he's coming down with something. Other strange things start to happen over the next few days. He makes himself a sandwich, and as he bites into it, he notices he can't taste a thing. Come to think of it, he really can't smell that much either. Could this be a cold? The flu? Something worse? Also, he just can't shake the feeling that he isn't alone in the house. It's as if he can feel a presence there with him. And not just one presence, but multiple. Could it have something to do with those strange dreams and hallucinations? The children in the masks? He suppresses the thoughts, not wanting to consider their implication. He can scarcely dare to ponder what's worse, that there really are strange little children in masks creeping around his home, making him sick or that he's losing his mind, just like his mother. He puts it out of his mind, but every so often, when he happens to glance out of the window, he can't help but see little shapes moving in the distance. When he watches the TV or tries to listen to music to distract himself, he notices that he needs to turn up the volume more than he ever did before. His hearing is getting worse. Could this be some kind of sinus thing? It's the only rational explanation. But it can be hard to apply a rational explanation when what's happening is inherently irrational. Several days later, after getting out of bed in the morning and standing in front of the bathroom mirror, the young man notices something is different. It's his skin. It's a pale, almost creamy color now, like all the life and vitality has been leached out of it. But it's not just that. He looks closer at his face in the mirror. His eyes. Have they always looked like that? Were they always that shade of dark, murky brown? Maybe it's his addled mind, but he can swear something is different, like the ground is shifting underneath his feet. That's when he notices something in the corner of the mirror. A little boy with dark blue overalls and a grinning cat mask. He just stands there, watching. The young man turns, hoping to finally see one of these strange children up close. But of course, there's nothing there. Over the following days, it all gets worse. Two weeks since the funeral, and his senses of taste and smell haven't returned. His hearing gets worse by the day, until he's almost entirely deaf. The sightings of the children don't stop but they're harder to make out. Over time, his vision starts to blur, and no matter how hard he rubs his eyes, they never clear. He stubs his toe, cracking the toenail open from tip to base, and he doesn't even notice. Little by little, feeling itself is starting to leave him, 
He doesn't even notice until the day he decides to chop some carrots for a soup he's making, hoping in vain that this one might be the meal he can finally taste. But his vision is getting so blurry now, he can barely… The knife cuts into his palm. It takes him a second to even register, because there's no pain and no blood. He stares at the clean wound in his palm with detached fascination, trying to work out the shapes in front of him to make sense of it all. What are those thin white strands sticking out of the cut? He grabs the edge of the skin, though it doesn't look much like skin now, more like pale ragged fabric, and he peels it back. No blood, no sinew, no flesh, just puffy white stuffing underneath. He's in bed and has been for a few days now. He can't taste, smell, hear, feel, or even see. All he can do is think in the dark. He's confused and afraid. He wants his mother, but she's long gone. On the outside, he's shrinking away, drawing into himself. He can't move or talk as he gets smaller and smaller. They walk in through the walls, the children in masks, ready to receive their new toy. The young man is nothing more. All that's left is another rag doll with a pair of brown button eyes laying on the bed. A little boy in a rabbit mask steps forward and picks it up. He stares at it for a moment before the children leave and the house is empty once more. This is the kind of unpleasant, anomalous experience you can expect from a close encounter with SCP-747, aptly nicknamed Children and Dolls. SCP-747 specifically refers to the phenomenon of these strange, anomalous children wearing animal masks. Studies have shown that, masks aside, all of these children are identical to children who have proven to have died around the time that their anomalous counterparts first manifested. This leads us to the working theory that the SCP-747 instances are spectral manifestations of the children they once were, twisted somehow by the unifying force of SCP-747. This is a theory supported by several pieces of unsettling information. Agents from the SCP Foundation disguised as grief counselors conducted interviews with the bereaved parents of each of the deceased children, and through these heart-wrenching interviews, they were able to discover that each of the children who died had possessed a doll that they loved very dearly. So much so, that the dolls were each buried with them, because on some level, the thought of separating them from this last comfort of the mortal world was too painful for the parents to bear. Given the preoccupation with dolls exhibited by SCP-747 instances, the Foundation found these facts to be highly illuminating. The physicality of SCP-747 instances, or rather, the lack thereof, also points towards the theory of them being powerful spectral manifestations. They are able to phase through solid surfaces of up to 10 centimeters in thickness and can sometimes have difficulty in holding solid objects due to their partially solid nature. They live mysterious and lonely lives on a plane of reality adjacent to our own, and they have never been seen to speak, though it's likely that they do have some form of communication with one another. Outside of individuals they're directly targeting, the SCP-747 children show little interest in other non-anomalous humans. They mainly seem to occupy themselves with their dolls and with each other. It is unknown to what extent the children are truly sentient, but they do appear to have some form of self-comprehension, manifesting in an awareness of the space they take up and their surroundings, which keeps them from bumping into things as they walk. But of course, their spectrality is hardly the most unsettling or eye-catching feature of SCP-747. No, the real danger of SCP-747 is the fact that they're able to turn human beings into dolls, a process which takes a matter of seconds to instill but 21 torturous days to finally take effect. In order to begin this process, the children will select a human that intrigues them, perhaps one that would fit in nicely with their collection. The Foundation isn't currently aware whether there are any fixed criteria for victim selection or if it's just a matter of wrong place at the wrong time. When the time is right and their selection is secure, they'll lock hands and form a ring around the human in question for five to seven seconds. This is all it takes. One, two, three, four, five six, seven seconds, and you're already at the point of no return. After completing this brief ritual, the children will go their separate ways, and the process will begin to take hold. This is why it's so imperative for the SCP Foundation to keep a lid on SCP-747's activities. While there's no cure for the process once the ritual is done, it is possible to prevent the ritual from being completed in the first place by escaping the circle and leaving the SCP-747 children. However, they have cognitohazardous measures against this, with many victims reporting a sense of blankness or thoughtlessness while within the circle. 
They induce a placid state of mind to prevent resistance from the horrible fate they're bestowing. The transformation doesn't incur any immediate symptoms. However, after 15 minutes or so, the victim will begin to experience numbness in the extremities, much like the kind caused by cold weather or poor blood circulation. Symptoms will gradually worsen over the next 21 days, though if the victim enters a state of chronic stress or anxiety, this process could potentially shorten to as little as 10 days. The conversion can often be neatly divided into three distinct stages. Stage 1 – Loss of Minor Senses The most frightening aspect of this initial stage of transformation is the fact that many of its symptoms could easily be written off as that of more common minor ailments. The senses of smell, taste, and hearing will begin to dampen and then disappear entirely, in what may at first seem like a severe cold. The victim may express a sense of distress at their condition at this stage, but will remain largely mentally stable. Any deviations from that expectation into more extreme mental instability should be taken as a sign of an accelerated transformation rate. However, towards the end of stage 1, a more pronounced change will start to take hold. The victim will notice a slow shift of their eye color and skin tone to reflect the colors of the doll, though this is only the beginning. Stage 2 – Loss of Major Senses Over the next 13 days, the victims will begin to lose their senses of sight and touch, resulting in extreme mental instability and stress. The victims may attempt to perform gruesome experiments on themselves, trying to rediscover feelings in their body, only to become more unstable upon realizing that these senses are gone for good. At this stage, the frightening anomalous physical changes will become even more pronounced. The skin of the victim will take on a rough, ragged quality as it transforms from normal skin into a variety of fabrics. The internal organs are also slowly transformed into a patchwork of synthetic stuffings, and even the victim's eyes will start to harden into buttons. However, the victim will remain alive throughout this entire grim process, even as their autonomy over their own body rapidly fades away. Stage 3 – Full Transformation Within 24 hours of entering Stage 3, the victim is fully and irreparably turned into a doll. The SCP-747 children will treat this doll just like they treat any others, and if ever a doll created by the influence of SCP-747 is destroyed, they will show greater interest in humans once again until a new target for conversion is selected. The SCP Foundation currently has seven SCP-747 specimens in containment. SCP-747-01 is an approximately seven-year-old male wearing a set of blue pajamas and a zebra mask. SCP-747-02 is an approximately 12-year-old male wearing swimming trunks and a mouse mask. SCP-74703 is an approximately 10-year-old female wearing a uniform typical of an expensive private school and a pig mask. SCP-74704 is an approximately 14-year-old male wearing a winter coat and a rabbit mask. SCP-74705 is an approximately 12-year-old female wearing a striped sari and a giraffe mask. SCP-74706 is an approximately 5-year-old girl with a bright pink dress typical of a beauty pageant contestant and a goat mask. And finally, SCP-74707 is an approximately 9-year-old male wearing blue overalls and a cat mask. Interestingly, he was also found with a physical note containing a short story about a mother searching for her child in the afterlife. Interestingly, the mother of this particular entity, before becoming an SCP-747 instance, is believed to have died in childbirth. All of the SCP-747 instances that the Foundation has in containment are kept in a single containment chamber, 30 meters by 10 meters in size, with concrete walls at least 15 centimeters thick to prevent the children from phasing through them. It is mandatory that any unusual behaviors by the children are reported to a superior immediately. If the children seem to take an interest in any members of the staff that research, guard, or attend to them, that member of personnel must be transferred to a different project immediately. The children are allowed a total of 25 dolls to keep them placated, excluding ones created by their anomalous influence, and the SCP Foundation only permits their dolls to be temporarily removed from the containment chamber for examination and repair. Any staff members who begin to show the previously described symptoms of anomalous SCP-747 influence are to be quarantined and contained separately. Task Force 747-B8 remains on call in the event of a containment breach to handle tracking, capture, and containment. Due to the incredibly volatile and dangerous nature of interfacing with SCP-747, Level 3 staff and above are only able to come into contact with them if the situation absolutely demands it. SCP-747 has been given the containment object class Euclid due to their phasing abilities and unpredictable nature. After all, who could ever really know what's going on behind those masks? 
But there's one more detail about SCP-747 that is perhaps the most frightening of all. There is evidence that suggests that the victims who have been turned into SCP-747 dolls may not actually be dead. In fact, they may still remain conscious, cut off from all their senses, slowly descending further into madness. Uncle S is the worst. Always has been. Every time the two of them go over to his house, he just sits in his room all day on his computer, he doesn't talk to them, just grunts occasionally, and never cooks them any food. The siblings have learned at this point to tell their mom to pack them lunch. Worst of all though, Uncle S is just a little strange. He has all these posters up all over his house, some of them with underdressed ladies on them. The brother's little sister always covers his eyes to stop him from looking. But there are other posters too, weirder ones, with these symbols on them and quotes written underneath. Neither of the kids can really read enough to know what the quotes mean, but their mom always gets very tense whenever they ask about them. She says they are something to do with politics, whatever that means. You know someone's weird when even their mom agrees. Uncle S is just weird. But there is a big upside to being at his house. The two of them can just sit downstairs in the lounge playing video games. He's got a big TV and a bunch of different game consoles, most of which are older than the two of them. This week he's even got a new box next to the TV. It's full of old wires, controllers, and games. And when they say old, they mean old. It all smells of dust. The brother reaches inside and pulls out a big gray box. The top half of it is lighter gray and the bottom darker. There's some red writing along the front of it. He carefully spells it out in his head before saying the words out loud. He doesn't want his little sister to know that he struggles with long words. Nintendo enter entertain entertainment system. His little sister huffs and sits on the sofa. She doesn't want to play that stupid thing. It looks old and the dust is making her sneeze. This whole house is dirty and gross. The TV and games consoles are the only nice thing in here. Why would she want to play with the gross one? The brother ignores her and tries to plug it into the TV. Wait, where's the HDMI on the back of this thing? He gives up pretty quickly. On the sofa, his sister switches on the TV and grabs the Xbox controller. The familiar cuphead music fills the room. They turn it down quickly. Can't be annoying Uncle S, who's sitting upstairs on his computer. Why does she always want to play Cuphead? It annoys her brother so much, they can't even beat the first level, it's way too hard. She chooses two-player, and Cuphead and Mugman both appear in the field, sunflower men parachuting down around them. You're up! The announcer yells on the screen. His sister starts running along as Cuphead, but bumps into the end of the screen. They need to both play together for this to work, but the brother isn't interested today. He reaches into the Nintendo box and rummages around finding something that fits perfectly into his hand. Something with a trigger. No way. He pulls the strange toy gun out of the box and holds it in the air triumphantly. It's gray, matching the NES console, with an orange trigger and the word Nintendo written on the side in that same red writing. A cord dangles out of the bottom of it. Immediately he spins around and points it at his sister and shoots. Nothing happens. No noise, no lights. She just sits there and scowls at him. Fine. He gets up off the floor and grabs the second Xbox controller. They run past the sunflower men and shoot the toadstool, but die at the first purple flower. Great. The boy is sick of this game. He doesn't want to keep playing it every week. He wants to play with the gun. Imagine what games he could play with that. He picks it back up. Cuphead and Mugman respawn, and the music starts over again. Very carefully, he peers down the barrel and takes aim at Cuphead. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! A puff of smoke, and Cuphead turns into a red ghost, pink heart beating. Wait, how did that happen? His sister didn't run into anything. She yells at him, that wasn't fair. The brother is very confused. He looks back down at the gun. It wasn't even plugged in, and it wasn't an Xbox gun. So how come it worked? He points it at Mugman and shoots. Bam! Another puff of smoke, and Mugman's ghost floats off the screen. The menu pops up, and the brother hits retry. The level starts again, the music kicks off, and the announcer yells, but Cuphead and Mugman aren't there. His sister wiggles the stick a few times. Nothing. The characters don't appear. What are you doing? Keep playing! She yells at him. But the brother can't see any characters left on the screen. Why is she pretending to see them still? Footsteps creak the floorboards above their heads. Uh-oh. Now they've done it. 
Uncle S appears on the stairs, scowling at them both. Immediately, each sibling points at the other one and blames them. Uncle S doesn't say a word. Instead, he glares at them as he walks over and snatches away their controllers. He turns and goes back upstairs. No more video games. No fair. The two of them slump on the couch, arms crossed, not saying anything. The NES zapper sits between them. Looks like they'll just have to watch TV instead. It's the brother's turn to choose something. He goes on Netflix and puts on Avatar The Last Airbender, her least favorite show. The opening credits roll, telling them all about the Fire Nation's attack. His sister snatches the gun up from the seat and points it at the screen, aiming at all the characters that pop up. Her brother ignores her. She's just being silly again. The episode starts. Aang is in a city in the Earth Nation, walking around a market surrounded by… His sister squeals. He looks at the TV, confused. Nothing has really happened. The characters are just standing around at the market talking. But his sister stares at the screen wide-eyed, almost a little scared looking. What's she doing? She points at the screen in amazement and says that Aang is dead. She pointed the gun at him and shot, and now he's dead. Yeah, right. Aang is perfectly fine. He's standing right there talking to Katara. The brother snatches the gun back and fires it at the screen. Bam! A gunshot rings out through the town square and Aang crumples to the ground. Katara screams and runs over to him. She tries desperately to wake him up, but there's no use. He just lies there dead in the square. No blood, of course, this is a children's show after all. Katara starts sobbing desperately and looks imploringly at the screen. The brother's mouth hangs open. Seriously? That's how the show ends? He thought there were a bunch of episodes left. How are they supposed to defeat the Fire Nation now? Who'd be the next Avatar? He looks over at his sister. Her mouth is hanging open still as well. Very hesitantly, he raises the barrel again and takes aim at one of the market stalls. He pulls the trigger. Bam! A watermelon explodes into red mush. The characters all jump back and run for cover. Sokka peers out from behind one of the carts, staring straight at them before ducking away again. This show is weird, I don't want to watch it anymore," the brother says, throwing the gun back down on the sofa and pressing back on Netflix. He's going to pretend like that didn't happen. His sister snatches the remote out of his hand and goes across to HBO Max. She puts on Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote. That's a safe option. They've seen every episode of that. No surprise endings, no characters dying, and most importantly, they both like it. The episode opens the same as it always does. Roadrunner is out running around the canyon. While E. Coyote has a new plan, he's going to paint what looks like a tunnel into the side of the cliff and make Roadrunner run straight into it, foolproof. But suddenly, his little sister has snatched the gun up off the sofa and is firing it here, there, and everywhere at the screen. But that look of horror is gone. She's laughing. No fair, he can't see what she's enjoying so much. It's just a normal episode. So he snatches the gun back from her and points it at Roadrunner. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! But Roadrunner just sidesteps the bullet and gives his trademark meep meep. He fires again. Bam, bam, bam. But every bullet seems to miss Roadrunner entirely, who dashes off into the sunset as out from the bush creeps a very injured wild E. Coyote, bullet wounds all over his body. He scowls at the brother and trudges off down the road, walking straight into the fake tunnel he painted. After a moment, the brother breaks out in laughter too. This gun is amazing. What should they watch next? Who have they always wanted to shoot? What if they shoot a hole in the dome around Sandy the Squirrel's house? Or kill the Shredder? Could Sonic outrun a bullet? Or what about all those silly children's shows his sister watches? Could he finally get those characters to stop singing all the time? He's laughing so loud, in fact, that he doesn't hear the footsteps coming down the stairs. He doesn't realize Uncle S is there until the shadow falls over him. Having fun? The brother tries to explain as best he can, but the gun is already out of his hands. The TV is off, and the remote disappears into Uncle S's pocket. In a grump, the two children sit there bickering quietly until their mom comes to get them an hour later. That evening, Uncle S is doing the same thing he always does. He lies on the couch, feet kicked up, instant ramen in his hands. The news is on, running a lame story about the president visiting some kindergarten in the run-up to the next round of primaries. What a joke. Uncle S lies there seething, thinking to himself, as if that guy cares about any of those kids. If he did, he'd be clamping down much harder on the borders to stop foreigners from coming and ruining their futures. How are these true-blooded Americans going to have any chance in life when their own country is being overrun? He switches over the channel. There's some cartoon playing. He hates cartoons even more. 
He holds the NES Zapper aloft. He's been carrying it around all afternoon for some reason. Imagine if it was a real gun. Without thinking, he points the Zapper at the TV and pulls the trigger. Bam! A gunshot makes him jump out of his skin. Was that outside? He looks back at the TV. The cartoon character is ducking down at the bottom of the frame, a bullet hole in the wall behind him. Oh, thank God. He was just in the show. Not a real gunshot. The character wags a finger at the screen. Careful now, the character says. If you keep doing that, the SCP Foundation is going to come and get you. Huh? SCP Foundation? That sounds dumb. This is why he doesn't watch cartoons. Animation is for kids. He flicks back over to the news. The president is still surrounded by children. Imagine if he could just point this gun at the president, right between his smug little eyes. Gently squeeze the trigger and... BAM! The shot makes him jump so violently that he spills boiling ramen all over his chest. He howls and leaps to his feet, trying to shake all the noodles off. Great, that was his last t-shirt. He's been wearing it for four days now, didn't even need to wash it yet. What was that noise, anyway? He glances up at the screen, and his jaw drops. The President of the United States is lying dead at the front of the kindergarten classroom. Blood trickles out from under his body. Secret Service agents swarm around him, shielding him from view and yelling at the cameraman to shut that thing off. The news cuts back to a distressed anchor. She's trying to talk, but is so overwhelmed by what she's just witnessed that the words aren't really coming. A breaking news headline crawls across the bottom of the screen. Breaking. The President of the United States assassinated. No way. Uncle S drops the gun and stands there panting. He didn't do that, did he? No. No, of course he didn't. That was a coincidence. All it was. Just a coincidence. If it was real, then he would point the gun at the anchor right now, pull the trigger, and... BAM! Her head rocks back. Blood sprays the back wall of the newsroom. The feed cuts out, and an ad break starts. It's some stupid infomercial. Only, the actors in it keep glancing nervously at the camera and slightly hunch behind tables and objects when they get the chance. Uncle S just keeps standing there staring at the screen all the way through the night. Two weeks later, Uncle S is running out of food. He ran out of ramen a couple of days ago, beans yesterday, and today he's having the last scraps of moldy bread. He hasn't left the house in all that time. He can't anymore. He's the most wanted man in the United States. Every night, the news is the same. His mugshot was plastered on the screen appealing to friends, families, witnesses, anyone to come forward and identify this man. Somehow, nobody has yet. His sister tried to call a handful of times, but he didn't pick up. Before long, he just disconnected his phone line entirely. The silence is better, helps him focus on his work. He's drawn up a list. In fact, he'd started to draw it up before he'd ever discovered the gun. On it are the names of every politician, business owner, media puppet, fake news spreading Illuminati shill he can think of. He just sits there hopping between TV channels, gun at the ready. He's got his laptop down here too, and he just spends most of the day searching through YouTube for different videos of people he's been wanting to kill. He'd be lying if he said there weren't a few annoying YouTubers that had made the list too. You know the ones he's talking about. The world is starting to fall apart out there. With the president gone, along with half of Congress and most major propaganda peddlers, it's all starting to unravel just like he'd always wanted. The military is being drafted in to suppress riots across the country, but doing little to contain it all. Random shootings keep breaking out, leading to more and more chaos. It will be painful for a while, Uncle S knows that, but in time, they'll learn their lesson. He just wonders how long he'll have. He can't keep getting away with this forever. Something's gonna give soon, it's got to. They have his mugshot, they have his name, and yet, no one is surrounding his house. He knows that because he set up webcams all around the perimeter of the house. He has the live feed open on his laptop. If anyone comes within 20 feet of the property, they're getting a neat little hole in the front of their head and getting the back of it blown into a hundred red, pink, and white chunks to give his weeds a bit of iron. In fact, he knows they'll be on their way soon. He knows that because some rat from his blog will have told them. He's been documenting everything on here, masking his IP address first, Uncle S has been recording and boasting about each and every kill anonymously as green text. At first, he kept it coy, writing in riddles and rhymes about the public figures he was murdering. But now, he is up to such a high tempo that they're just a bullet point list of names. Of course, his posts have all been flooded with trolls acting like he hadn't done anything at all, pretending like the president is still alive along with everyone else, photoshopping screenshots to make it look like they were getting new photos of these people. 
Great trolling, they almost had him doubting his own eyes at times. But every night, the news channels didn't lie. Another 232 public figures dead, shot through the head by an unknown gunman. But tonight, they'll be coming for him. The SCP Foundation. They'll be on their way. The characters on the TV have told him all he needs to know about them. He can't hide here forever. He almost wants them to come, really. He very explicitly made a threat tonight. A threat about a deadly surprise under the stadium at the Super Bowl. They're not going to ignore that. Any moment now. He's ready for the shootout. He has his webcam set up to cover every inch of his surrounding yards. Any SWAT team or SCP agent that gets close will get gunned down immediately. Their only option would be to hit him with a drone strike. And what a way to go that would be. No one would ever forget him. He'd be a martyr for the cause. They'd build statues in his honor. He licks his lips and stares at the feed. Nothing. For almost 45 minutes. Nothing. There, a shadow crosses the corner of the frame. Then another. A gun points into the shot. They're here. A team of them by the looks of things. He can see their shadows lining up along the sidewalk out by the front of his house. He'll wait. He's gonna wait for them to all line up nicely in the shot, then open fire. He's been practicing so much that his aim's gotten pretty good. Clean shot to the head, one by one. Now! Bam! 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 The gunshots ring out one after the other as he fires at the laptop screen. He catches each of the SCP agents cleanly through the head, one after the other. A couple break for cover, but there's no hope. Bam! 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 He picks each of them off. He makes sure to shoot the last man in the leg and sits quietly for a moment, watching him crawl across the lawn. Uncle S raises the barrel and points it at the man's head. He squeezes the trigger. Crash! The front door flies open and Foundation field agents flood his house. But how can that be possible? He just killed all of them outside the front door. He watched them die. How are they still here? He looks incredulously out of the front door into the yard. No blood, no bodies, no evidence of what had just happened. The SCP agents swarm around him, guns raised and barking orders. He snaps back to reality and panics, throwing his arms in the air and letting the toy gun drop limply to the floor. I did it. I killed the President of the United States. It was me. He starts crying as they handcuff him and press his face into the carpet. The agents question him, confused. What is he talking about? The President is alive and well. He's in the middle of his next election campaign, doing better than ever in the polls. I killed them. I killed them all. It was me. Again, the agents are perplexed. As the uniformed men drag him outside and throw him into the back of the van, he can't help but wonder why everything seems so peaceful out here. Where has his apocalypse gone? The doors slam shut. In this moment, I am very much hoping that no one viewing this video is in possession of SCP-674, or an equivalent weapon currently unknown to the Foundation. You see, while SCP-674, otherwise known as the Exposition Gun, poses no threat to me in the real world, it could have a nasty effect on your perception of reality. The Exposition Gun appears to be an entirely normal Nintendo Entertainment System zapper. As far as the Foundation can tell, it matches up perfectly with other models released in North America from around 1985. You can take the zapper apart, examine each plastic and electronic component individually, reassemble it, and you will fail to see anything out of the ordinary for this video game peripheral. And yet, if you were to hold this gun up to your screen right now, point it at me, and fire, you would hear a gunshot ring out and watch me collapse in my chair, dead. For the rest of the duration of the video, you would watch me sit here in silence. Videos would continue to upload to this channel, but each of them would probably just show my corpse as it slowly rots away in this chair. To anyone else, however, it would be business as usual as I uncover more horrifying, unnerving, fascinating, and bizarre tales from the SCP Foundation. The exposition gun only works on its user, forever altering the reality they perceive through whichever digital screen they fire at. If they shoot the president, as Mr. S did, then in the continuity of any news program they watch, the president will forever be dead. The same applies to fictional shows as well. If the main character dies off, a sidekick steps in to take their place, and the story changes accordingly. It is to be noted that each show or movie follows its own internal logic, however. The children were unable to shoot Roadrunner because he always gets away. But in classic cartoon fashion, all of their missed bullets ended up hitting a very forlorn Wild E. Coyote. In this context, however, the gun was proved not to be fatal, as in the universe of that show, explosions, electrocutions, falls from cliffs, and drownings can never kill the coyote. 
so of course a gunshot would be no different. What is most interesting, however, is the gun's apparent awareness of the SCP Foundation. Users who fire the gun into the camera frequently will find characters soon breaking the fourth wall and warning them to stop it soon for fear of being caught by the Foundation. Perhaps most chilling and still unexplained to this day was Mr. S's ultimate demise. Between rounds of questioning, he was locked in a cell with a lone security camera watching him. Mr. S was observed conversing with the camera frequently, apparently hearing replies, though none could be heard in any of the recordings. Over time, these debates grew more and more aggressive until, all of a sudden, he was shot down in his cell. Researchers and agents rushed in, but were too late. Three 38 caliber bullets were lodged in his chest, with no evidence of a shooter in sight. The man died on the scene, and researchers have since been wary about experimenting too much with the exposition gun. It's the last day of sixth grade, and there are only seconds left before the final bell rings and school is officially out for summer. An excitable 11-year-old girl sits at her desk, bouncing her leg in anticipation and watching the clock. Soon, she'll have three glorious months of freedom. But more importantly, she can take her mom up on a life-changing promise. They made a deal when they moved to this new town. If she could get through sixth grade with straight A's and good feedback from her teachers, she could finally get a pet of her own. There were some stipulations, of course. The pet can't be too big, can't make a lot of noise, and needs to be something she can take care of by herself. It was hard work, but she buckled down, studied hard, and even found a math tutor. The time is now in five, four, three, two, one. The last bell of the year rings and the class erupts into cheers. Summer's here. She shoves her books into her bag and runs out the door so quickly she barely catches her teacher's parting words of, have a great summer vacation, everyone. The halls are swamped with kids all rushing toward the buses, their parents' cars, or their final walk home of the school year. She's right there with them, the promise of the day putting an extra spring in her step. Many of the faces in the hall are still unfamiliar. After a year of being the new kid in town, she hasn't made many friends, but none of that matters now. She's going to get a special friend today, something all her own that she can nurture, play with, and won't ever have to worry about impressing. It's only a short walk to the pet store, and then an even shorter walk to her house. As she makes her way down the sidewalk, the sun beaming down on her smiling face, the girl lets her mind wander. What kind of pet should she get? A dog needs to be walked, that might be too much work. A fish? Maybe, but you can't play with a fish. You can't pet a fish, or at least it won't be happy if you try. She remembers a pet tarantula her eccentric aunt once had and shudders. No spiders, definitely not. She wants something friendly, something small enough that her mom won't complain, but something she can cuddle and really bond with. Whatever it ends up being, she's going to take great care of it. The walk feels much longer than it is, the anticipation stretching the minutes until they feel like hours. She spots the sign in the shape of a dog playing with a ball, and her heart skips a beat. She's reached the pet store. Inside, there are an overwhelming number of options. She walks through the reptile section, pressing her face to the class of tanks housing iguanas, slithery snakes, tiny darting lizards with brightly colored tails. Nearby, there are fat green tree frogs and bumpy toads with huge watery eyes. She briefly pauses at the fish, enticed by their vivid colors and the staggering variety of shapes and sizes. But a fish is such a boring pet, she thinks. What can you even do with a fish? She moves on, looking at a litter of fluffy, tabby kittens. They romp and roll around on top of each other, flicking their tails and stretching their soft paws. They're adorable, and her heart melts. But then she thinks about having to scoop a litter box and decides to move on. There are roly-poly hamsters and sleek-looking rats, tiny white mice with pink eyes and gerbils running on wheels. Suddenly, a sign catches her eye. Exotic pets, it reads. Huh? What could be over there? She tiptoes into the section, almost feeling like she's stumbled into somewhere she shouldn't be. There are ferrets wiggling around and playing with a ball, fluffy chinchillas that look impossibly plush and soft to the touch, little sugar gliders peeking out of cloth pouches with wide eyes. There's even a skunk blinking at her curiosity. But nothing feels quite right. None of these pets seem like the one she has to bring home. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she spots something curious. A row of small cardboard packages covered with inviting cartoonish text, advertising something called a custom pet. She picks up one of the packages and reads the description. It sounds impossible, too good to be true. 
Just buy these packaged eggs, place them anywhere in your house, and a perfectly matched pet will hatch and fit right in. It will become exactly the kind of pet that you need. She looks for any sort of fine print, something that might indicate this is a toy or some kind of joke, but it looks real. Could it be? Shyly, the girl takes one of the packages up to the cash register. The employee goes to scan it, but there's no barcode. Did you bring this in with you? The cashier asks. She shakes her head. Okay, well, we don't sell these, so I guess you can just take it? The girl's eyes go wide. Really? She can just have it for free? The cashier is already waving her off, beckoning the next customer to come check out. Not wanting to question her good luck, she takes off without a second thought. The run home from the pet store is a total blur of excitement. All she wants to do is get inside, make a peanut butter sandwich, and figure out where to put her new pet's egg before her mom gets home from work. Not that she's doing anything wrong, it's just easier if she takes care of things before her mom can ask too many questions. She's doing them both a favor, really, taking care of all the logistics so her mom doesn't have to worry about it. She pulls her house key from her pocket and unlocks the door with shaky hands. It's almost time. Forget the sandwich, the sandwich can wait. She needs to get upstairs to her room right now and start her life with her new pet, whatever it ends up being. She throws her backpack on her bed and sits down on the floor, tearing open the cardboard packaging. Inside, there are six tiny eggs sealed in plastic. She just wants one pet, so she'll start with one egg for now. Of course, if the pet ends up being lonely, maybe it'll want a friend? She shakes off the thought. She can figure all of those details out later. She's just about to puncture the plastic so the egg can breathe when she stops. Where should she put it? She was so excited to leave the store she forgot to pick up a tank or terrarium or somewhere a traditional pet would live. The packaging says these pets can live anywhere, but do they really mean anywhere? If she does something wrong and her new pet is hurt or doesn't hatch at all, it'll just break her heart. Then she spots a potential solution. An old dollhouse, frilly and pastel pink and surprisingly spacious inside, sits next to her bed. She hasn't played with dolls in a while, insisting she was too old for them when she started sixth grade. But now, she's thrilled that she didn't get rid of her dollhouse just yet. Even if the dolls don't live there anymore, maybe now it can be a home for something new, for whatever hatches out of this strange little egg. Carefully, she breaks the plastic seal on the egg and places it inside the dollhouse. All of the doll furniture and little plastic choking hazards are gone, leaving only a pretty pink Victorian-style enclosure where the egg can safely hatch. Now, all she has to do is wait. Later that night, the girl wakes from a deep sleep to the sound of something moving inside the dollhouse, the skitter of tiny legs, the rustling of something inside the formerly vacant dollhouse. She sits up and is about to go peek inside when a chill of fear runs down her spine. What if it's something horrible? She doesn't know what kind of eggs those were. She'd never seen anything like them before. What if it's a spider or a worm or some other awful monstrous thing she can't even imagine? and she brought it into her home, to where she and her mom sleep without even questioning it. She sits for a moment, the only sound the rustling of the thing in the dollhouse and her own short, panicked breaths. Then there's another sound, huh? light and sweet, like a little bird chirping. It's coming from the dollhouse. Curiosity finally gets the better of her, and she opens the dollhouse, lifting the roof off. Inside, she spots it, her new pet. Feathery soft fur, pastel pink and white, covers the little animal, which is currently exploring its new home delightedly. It flicks around a poofy little tail that looks a bit like a lavender feather duster, and stops to blink up at her with two large, friendly purple eyes. Slowly, she reaches a hand down to pet the animal, and it nuzzles into her palm, body vibrating with something like a kitten's purr. Any tension she felt before melts out of her body as she realizes the packaging was not lying. She put the pet in an environment that was comforting, sweet, happy, a piece of childlike joy, and it had become the living embodiment of those things. For a brief moment, she wonders how she'll explain this new addition to the household, what she'll need to feed it, and what her mom will say. But then her new best friend chirps happily again, and all she can think is, this is going to be an amazing summer. Things worked out very well for the girl. Meanwhile, other families across town were screaming in horror as a tiny fire-breathing creature set their drapes ablaze, and another slowly dropped down from the ceiling on a silvery thread, blending into the shadows. This girl was not the only child to bring home one of these miraculous pets and hatch it in her home, and other children were much less careful about where they put the eggs. Of course, the children weren't to blame here. 
The blame lay with whoever was behind the design and widespread release of these odd little animals, also known as SCP-1550. SCP-1550 is a species of artificially synthesized creatures of unknown classification who are highly adaptable to any given environment. Their larvae will develop, grow, and change to fit whatever setting their eggs are placed in. Though adult specimens vary greatly in appearance, they all have markings on their underbelly that read, a Dr. Wondertainment trademark. Because of their highly adaptable nature, it is uncertain exactly what the original form of these creatures might look like. SCP-1550 eggs are one centimeter long, beige in color, and stored in airtight plastic packaging that prevents them from hatching until they are exposed to the outside air. The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-1550 after a collection of bizarre cardboard packages were found in the exotic pet section of a pet store. None of the workers had ever seen these packages before and had never even heard of SCP-1550 prior to being asked about it. The packages were brought into containment immediately and were found to each contain six SCP-1550 eggs in airtight containers. The original packaging also contained an instruction leaflet, which I have managed to get my hands on a copy of. It reads, Hey kids, your parents aren't letting you get a dog or cat? Don't fret, buy a Dr. Wondertainment custom pet! A Dr. Wondertainment's custom pet is far superior to an ordinary and boring cat or dog due to their original Adapto Eggs packaging, a Dr. Wondertainment invention. Just leave your custom pet Adapto Eggs around the house and when they hatch they'll fit right in. Perfect for apartments. To get your very own custom pets is easy, kids. Just put an egg in your house and break the plastic seal to give your new pet some air so it can hatch. Your new pet will be perfect for where you live, wherever you live. If your new custom pet seems lonely, just add another Adapto egg and get him a new friend. Dr. Wondertainment is not responsible for injuries or death caused by this or any other product. Wondertainment custom pets are shipped out prefixed. Who exactly is this Dr. Wondertainment? A person? A corporation? A highly intelligent octopus with a penchant for toy design? The identity of the force behind the trademark is undetermined, but whatever Dr. Wondertainment is, one thing is certain. The toys they create are highly unusual. Dozens of Wondertainment's creations have been contained by the SCP Foundation, including SCP-2855, SCP-2396, and SCP-111. They range from useful to whimsical to downright destructive and the motives behind each invention are currently unknown. SCP-1550 is just one in a long line of anomalous toys from the shadowy toy maker. And so, like they have with so many other Wondertainment products, the research staff at the Foundation decided to perform some exploratory tests on these supposed custom pets. First, one SCP-1550 egg was placed in a tank of seawater and left to hatch. When it did, it produced a specimen with gills all along its upper back, behind its eyes, an array of flat and broad tails it could use to swim efficiently. Further examination of the creature revealed that it excreted special mucus to protect its eyes from the salt water, and a swim bladder that was discovered during dissection. The skin of the creature was a mottled blue, giving it natural camouflage in its seawater environment. Next, the team decided to place an egg in fresh water and see what different adaptations were produced. A tank was filled with water from a river behind the testing site, and the egg was placed inside until it hatched. Interestingly, this specimen of SCP-1550 did not possess any gills, suggesting similar circumstances would not necessarily produce the same adaptations. Instead, this specimen had enlarged lungs and a thin, streamlined body for more efficient movement. Next, the team prepared a terrarium meant to simulate the ecosystem of a temperate forest and placed the next egg inside. When it hatched, it produced a specimen of SCP-1550 covered in a layer of brown fur, with a ridged underbelly resembling that of a snake. It also had a tail consisting of large tentacles. Along the ridged underbelly, there was a smooth patch of skin with the Dr. Wondertainment logo printed, like a tattoo. The team prepared a different terrarium that simulated a desert ecosystem and allowed an egg to hatch inside. The resulting specimen was cold-blooded, tan in color to blend in with the sand, and skilled at burrowing quickly to protect itself from outside stressors. It was also, notably, one centimeter larger than the previous specimens. The final terrarium was made to simulate the environment of an average urban apartment. The egg that hatched inside produced a creature with leathery skin and eyes placed similarly to those of a chameleon. The demeanor of the specimen was noticeably friendlier than its predecessors, and it acted more like a domesticated house pet than a wild animal. Its most impressive adaptation was its method of eating. Behind the specimen's jaw, 
there were strands of baleen like those found in whales, which allowed the creature to filter feed on dust and crumbs from the terrarium floor. After these experiments proved successful, the research team decided to test the eggs in more extreme environments. One egg was placed in a vat of molten iron. It promptly burst into flames and was completely destroyed. The head researcher responded, well, what did you expect to happen? Which seems like a fair point. The next egg was placed inside a vacuum chamber, which was then depressurized. The egg promptly exploded, covering the inside of the chamber in an unidentifiable slime. These two less than successful experiments led the research team to the conclusion that SCP-1550 eggs cannot survive in conditions that would be uninhabitable for any other animal. There are limits to the creature's adaptability. But what would happen to an egg placed in a hostile environment filled with something recognizable? A vacuum chamber was filled with seawater, and an egg was placed inside. The chamber was then pressurized to 15,750 psi. This time, the egg was not destroyed, but instead was able to successfully hatch. The resulting SCP-1550 specimen bore a heavy resemblance to several deep-sea creatures, most notably the anglerfish. Like the anglerfish, the creature had a bioluminescent lure dangling from its forehead. It also had gills, dark gray-blue skin, flat and webbed fins, and enlarged eyes twice the size of those found on other specimens. Its teeth were sharp and ridged, similar to those of a shark. The head researcher made a note on this portion of the experiment log, asking, just what kind of child Dr. Wondertainment is trying to sell these things to that they could live in conditions where a creature like that could be kept as a pet? All adult specimens of SCP-1550 are kept in a sealed 5 meter by 5 meter terrarium, which simulates desert conditions. This terrarium is monitored via electronic surveillance, and each of the specimens is implanted with a tracking device. If one or more of the specimens escapes, the area is locked down until all of the creatures have been captured and placed back in their terrarium. All SCP-1550 eggs are kept in their packaging unless being used for testing. As the Foundation does not want the population of adult specimens to exceed 20 at any given time, excess specimens are terminated. Honestly, that makes me a little sad. I'd be happy to take them in if the research team can't keep them. But I digress. Having a pet is a big responsibility, and some people just can't handle the risks and rewards that come with caring for an animal, especially one that can become an accidental weapon if you're not careful. If your child is begging you for a pet, maybe you should start them out with a goldfish first. A goldfish never burnt the house down, though I suppose there's a first time for everything. Introducing Tamagotchi. Are your parents super lame and refusing to buy you a pet? Well, eat my shorts, mom and dad. With the all-new Tamagotchi, you can have the best pet you could ever ask for, living in the Digisphere in your pocket. With three simple buttons and a chain to hang your key rings on, you can make your Tamagotchi your own. Care for it day and night, watch them sleep, play bodacious games, and make sure you keep an eye out for if they need to go to the toilet. P.U. Throw it in your backpack and take it to school. Just don't let your teacher catch you. Oh, snap! Tamagotchis are da bomb! Bet you really want to go and buy one now, don't you? The detective throws her bag onto the couch. She wanted nothing more than to have thrown it off as soon as she walked through the door. But if anything in it broke, she'd be screwed. They don't have the money for rent at the moment. Can't be adding additional costs onto that. Her boyfriend barely glances up at her from the couch still wearing the same blue t-shirt he'd worn to bed last night and with a packet of Doritos next to him, it's pretty obvious how he spent his day. The TV switches to another commercial. She taps him gently on the shoulder, offering him a warm smile. He jumps a little, seeming to come out of a little reverie. Affection fills his eyes as soon as he sets them on her. He hastily brushes Doritos dust off his hands and holds them up, tapping out words in sign language. Sorry, I zoned out. How was your day? The detective sinks into her usual spot on the couch and snuggles up next to him, nuzzling her head into his neck. After a quick hug, she untangles her hands and signs her reply. Long. He kisses her on her forehead. She goes on to tell him all about the case she's been working on. It's more of a hunch at this point than a case, really. There's been a big spree of shopliftings, burglaries, and muggings over the last couple of months. A significant uptick from this time last year, but everyone is at a loss to figure out why. She's having to spend a lot more on gas driving around to break-ins at the moment. Her boyfriend watches her hands recount the events with a tender look of concern on his face. Don't worry, she signs. I'll make sure they reimburse me for the gas. He nods and seems to relax a little. She hesitates before signing the next bit. Did you do any job applications today? Her boyfriend sighs and shakes his head. 
He looks ready to be told off, but instead, she gives him a big cuddle. Something in him seems to break, and after a moment, she can feel him shaking in her arms. Even though she can't hear him, the detective knows her boyfriend well enough to know that he is crying. She pulls away from him and makes firm, reassuring eye contact with him before signing, It's okay. We can do the next one together if that would be easier. And so the two of them do that. They cook dinner together, her boyfriend listening to the radio while she enjoys the feeling of the bass in her chest. Then, once everything is washed up and the apartment is dark and cozy, they sit down at their kitchen table and handwrite a cover letter. They would have typed it up on their Macintosh, but they'd sold that and their printer a few months ago to cover their utility bills. But handwriting is okay too. Her boyfriend had been working at Dell when they met. 1993, the height of the dot-com boom, when any kid with a math degree and a keyboard could shoot up the ladders in tech giants across the country. Two years later, that bubble burst and he'd lost his job. Fiercely smart and incredibly kind, her boyfriend hadn't been able to find work for around 13 months now. Every day, the detective's heart broke a little more to see how low his confidence was dipping. He was an amazing person, by far the most exceptional guy she'd ever met and ever would meet, and yet the constant rejection letters, failed interviews, and lack of options had steadily worn him down to a delicate and exhausted ghost of himself. But that only makes her want to love and support him even more. He scrawls a signature at the bottom of the cover letter, and they carefully fold it along with his resume and slide them both into an envelope. She cuddles him from behind and gives him a gross wet kiss on his cheek, enough to make him giggle. There, at least he's got one happy moment from today. He turns to her and grins, raising his hands to talk to her. I might buy a Tamagotchi. A what? The commercial on TV, it was playing when you got home. I really want one, can I buy one? A little twinge pulls at her heart. She really ought to say no. Money is so tight at the moment with them both relying on her income. And it's hard to... Nah, what is she saying? He's clearly going through a lot right now, and maybe something fun would be good for him. Even if it does just look like some silly kid's toy from Japan. She raises her hands. Of course you can. And the pair of them go back over to the TV and flick it on. The next day is a bit of a blur. It's the detective's first day on yet another shoplifting, her first foray into fashion. Pairs of Air Jordans on display had been stolen, smashed glass everywhere. The thieves had left all the cash in the register. A couple other items were missing too, all very hip stuff. Tie-dye shirts, Jenko jeans, a lot of camouflage, that kind of thing. Stuff that's on TV and the radio all the time at the moment. By the time the detective gets out, she's only got 10 minutes to rush to Toys R Us before it closes. Thankfully, the Tamagotchi display is right by the front entrance, almost totally sold out. But with one lone box left, she snatches it up and cheerfully takes it to the cash register. As she walks out of the store and looks down at the box in her hands, she can't help but wonder, why the hell would her boyfriend want to play with a little children's toy? As soon as the detective opens the door to her apartment, she is struck by a change. Instead of sitting on the couch watching TV, her boyfriend is in the kitchen, radio belting out at full volume. Her heart flutters. Could it be? Has he heard back from one of his jobs? He sticks a head out from around the kitchen door and grins at her, beckoning her inside. She grins back, quickly hiding the Toys R Us bag behind her back. It smells amazing in here. Onions and garlic, oregano, rich tomatoes, a hint of wine in the sauce. He's really gone all out making her favorite chili for dinner tonight. He waves her over to the pan and motions for her to take a deep smell. She does, enjoying all of the aromas filling the air. There's something smoky in there too, a new smell she doesn't recognize. She turns to her boyfriend quizzically. He grins and explains to her in sign language that it's charred peppers, held over the flames on the hob just long enough to blacken and then thrown into the food processor to… Hang on, she interrupts him. We don't have a food processor. Her boyfriend grins proudly and steps to one side to reveal a brand new shining food processor sitting proudly on their countertop. He explains to her that he bought it that day. It has 10 speed settings, multiple blades you can switch out, a miniature container for spice blends, and she stops him again. How much did this cost? He looks sheepish. A wave of realization crosses his eyes, and he looks back at it guiltily. I just really wanted it, he signs. Thought it would make a nice romantic dinner for us. The detective softens. Of course, he was just trying to make the effort for her. It wasn't fair of her to tell him off for doing that. Opening the Toys R Us bag, she pulls out the Tamagotchi and holds it out to him. Compared to this expensive food processor, her gift looks pretty insignificant, but her boyfriend's face lights up straight away. He grabs it off her and rips the toy out of the packaging in a frenzy, 
His eyes shine and dance around as he hatches his first Tamagotchi. He looks like a child on Christmas Day. She can't help but join in laughing with him as they go to sit on the couch and watch some TV together. But the next day, when the detective gets home, she notices a hole in their wall. A literal hole. Their landline is missing. Her boyfriend's face pops out from around the corner, just as it did the previous day, with that same grin. Only this time, he's brandishing a brand new cell phone in his outstretched arm. It's tiny, about the size of a brick, with the name Nokia emblazoned across the top. That can't have been cheap. This time, she doesn't share in his excitement. Indeed, the next day, she can't even muster up a smile when he proudly demonstrates the alarm on his new G-Shock, laced up his new Jordans, and started excitedly flipping through his box set of R.L. Stein books. That is enough. She can't deal with this anymore. She's been struggling so hard to make ends meet. Meanwhile, he's throwing away hundreds of dollars on products he had never mentioned before. She snaps. It can be very frustrating being mute, because you can't shout to let your anger out. All that energy instead goes into her sign language, her hands swinging and slapping into each other as her face contorts. What's wrong with him? Why is he being like this? She's doing everything she can to keep a roof over their heads, while he's just throwing all of her money down the drain. How could he be so cruel? The more she rants, the more guilty her boyfriend's face becomes. Tears fill his eyes, his bottom lip starts to tremble, and before long, he is bawling in front of her. Can't keep going, not seeing him like this. Her hands fall limply to her sides. After a moment, he raises a sniffling face to her and signs something simple back. It's the TV, the commercials, they're just too persuasive. She snorts a laugh, <laughs> and that's it. If he's not going to give her a serious answer, she's not going to have a serious conversation. She storms off up to bed, leaving him alone downstairs. He switches the TV off. That next day, she wakes up to breakfast in bed, but no sign of her boyfriend. She doesn't touch any of it, getting a coffee and croissant on her way into work instead from this up-and-coming coffee place called Starbucks. Today is a chance for her to take her mind off things. She's at a crime scene in a poor neighborhood. The previous night, the man who lived there had been sitting downstairs with his blinds open out to the street. He'd noticed a suspicious figure walking past who'd peered in through the glass. Before he knew what was happening, a brick crashed through his window and the burglar was in his home, running from room to room, ransacking the place and trying to make off with different items from the house. The homeowner had run to his gun safe and shot the burglar in the back four times. The crime scene investigation was mostly a formality, but as the detective arrived, one of the officers came over to her. He didn't know sign language, so the pair of them wrote down their conversation on her detective's notepad. Yes, she carries a notepad, some stereotypes are true. The officer has a hunch, and a good one. The burglar broke into the house knowing full well the homeowner was watching him, a highly risky thing to do. But what was most peculiar was the list of items that the burglar had been trying to steal. The officer shows her the list, and her jaw drops. G-Shock watch, food processor, Nike Air Jordans, R.L. Stein books, a Tamagotchi. An officer across the room remarks that these are all really high-demand items at the moment. His own wife and kids have been pleading for some of these for weeks. The crime scene photographer agrees. It all gets written on the notepad so that the detective can follow the conversation. What was this man's employment status? She asks. Unemployed. She looks around the room. There's not much in the way of furniture here. Just a couch pointing at a big TV. The detective drives home right away, to the surprise of her boyfriend. He gets up from the couch and comes to see her right away. He's dressed much better, a white shirt on. He's tidied the house. The TV is off. He goes to start apologizing as soon as she walks in, but she brushes it aside, signing urgently to him. I need you to tell me everything about what you've been watching on TV. Confused, he runs through his list of regular shows that he's been watching. Buffy, Quantum Leap, The Fresh Prince, Friends, of course. She shushes him. What about commercials? All the things you've bought recently, talk to me about those commercials. He looks stumped. They're just normal TV commercials, nothing special or exciting. They're all different, different actors, messages, companies. It clicks in the detective's head. That's it. What about the voiceover? I don't know. It's a man, I think. Yeah, it might be the same man. You know what? I think it is. It's the same voice each time. And he only does those commercials? Her boyfriend thinks hard for a second. He nods. It takes a long time for the police to mobilize, as usual. The detective takes her findings to the commissioner at her first opportunity, but he looks pretty nonplussed. This spate of burglaries and muggings, all because of some persuasive voiceover actor? Really? Everyone wants a Tamagotchi. Everyone wants a pair of Jordans. These are just passing fads. That's all there is to it. So, she does it herself. 
the detective visits all of the advertising agencies that ran the local versions of the commercials she has listed and finds the details for the voice actor on her third try. He's in the same state, but another city. But by the time she gets an afternoon to drive out and pay him a visit, it's too late. The apartment she visits is empty. After banging on the door for several minutes, a neighbor sticks their head out of a window and yells something at her. The detective can't understand, however, so the woman comes downstairs and writes a grumpy note. He's dead, yacht accident or something. Only she can't spell yacht properly. The detective pushes open her apartment door dejectedly. All that effort, all that chasing, for nothing. It wasn't so much about trying to solve the burglaries, those were just things being taken. It was about understanding what had happened to the love of her life, her kind, caring boyfriend, the man who'd brought her so much joy, who had always been so considerate and gentle with her, suddenly going on a spending spree and almost bankrupting her. It just hurt too much. And now, coming back to her apartment and having to face up to that tense relationship just felt... Arms wrap around her and hold her tight. Her boyfriend's hand brushes the back of her hair, and the smell of his cologne fills her nose. After a moment, her arms wrap around him. After another moment, they both start to cry together. He leads her into the kitchen, where he's cooked her favorite chili again, only without the smoky smell. She looks around the kitchen. The food processor is gone. He pulls away from her and explains that everything is gone. All of his bad purchases he'd made have been returned. He hands her the cash for them in full. He still wants those items. He wants them more than anything else, he explains. But more than any of those things, he wants her. The TV is gone too. So as they sit down that evening together, they just enjoy doing nothing together for a bit, catching each other's eyes over dinner and smiling uncontrollably before getting out a sheet of paper and writing another job application. There's something about this application, the detective thinks. This one could just be the one. Ask anyone about the 90s and they'll have more fads to tell you about than historical events. Furbies, Beanie Babies, Gel Pens, Napster, the list goes on. But for residents in a certain part of the USA, some of these trends seem to touch more obsessive. And that is all down to the actions, or rather, the voice of one man. SCP-661, the world's best salesman. We didn't get to meet SCP-661 today, so allow me to introduce him to you. The salesman is a middle-aged Caucasian male. He is somewhat overweight, but with no major health issues aside from what is typical for someone of his age and size. If you were to have a conversation with SCP-661, and I advise you not to, you would find him rude, abrasive, and tiresome. He has a short temper and makes regular demands. You would quickly find that he is very much used to having his own way, and for good reason. For you see, this salesman is persuasive. Very persuasive. Foundation testing has found that this SCP is capable of extreme manipulation, verbally persuading you to want what he tells you to want, virtually instantaneously. It sounds dramatic in those words, but the effect is far more subtle than you may realize, which is the reason why he was able to operate for a while before being discovered by the Foundation. Test subjects report the effects of his persuasion as feeling like a continuous, low-level compulsion, a desire bubbling away underneath the surface until they encounter an opportunity to act on it. At this point, it becomes an all-consuming obsession, not satiated until you have fulfilled the urge. The effect is strongest with physical objects, which is likely why this salesman enjoyed so much success providing voiceovers for local marketing campaigns. Any product that he was selling would fly off the shelves anywhere where the commercial featuring his voice were aired. Perhaps those crazes in the 90s weren't so innocent after all. Testing on the salesman has proved enlightening. D-Class personnel were ordered to physically assault him, but he was able to stop the attack almost immediately by simply explaining to them that they didn't want to hurt him. However, test subjects who were threatened with execution if they stopped attacking him were able to continue to beat the salesman up for several minutes before the researchers decided he'd had enough. Though notably, they made it abundantly clear the entire way through the assault that they didn't really want to hurt him. SCP-661 naturally poses some level of threat to the general public, as his abilities could easily be used for far more nefarious purposes than selling a few more troll dolls, and so guards have permission to terminate him in the event of his escape. That seems unlikely. SCP-661 is held in a standard holding cell measuring 6 meters by 8 meters. Any researchers interacting with him must wear noise-canceling ear protection at all times, unless they are deemed to be totally deaf by SCP medical staff. Incidentally, it was the work of the detective you heard about today that drew the Foundation's attention to SCP-661. 
Unaffected by his commercial work, she was in the perfect position to connect the dots and uncover his existence. With operatives through law enforcement, the Foundation was quick to catch on to her theory and apprehend him before word traveled too far. That yacht accident story was enough to keep the public from ever discovering his existence. That said, you should still be careful out there. Who knows if another instance of this SCP exists somewhere? Have you ever seen a commercial too tempting to ignore? Watched a YouTube ad that you decided not to skip? No? Me neither. But still, be careful. It is the mid-19th century, in a village not far from St. Petersburg, Russia, where a sideshow carnival has been set up. There are a number of tents displaying various attractions, a man juggling fire in front of one. In another, a large bear balances on top of a ball. A detective from the St. Petersburg police force has been led here in the course of his investigation into the disappearance of a local chess prodigy's twin daughters. He had heard a rumor that the girls may be here, and he could easily imagine a kidnapping victim forced to perform as part of this seedy traveling circus. After passing by a contortionist and a man throwing knives at a woman strapped to a board, he found what he had been looking for, a large tent with a hand-painted sign reading, The Samurai, See the Unbeatable Chess Automaton. The detective had heard about these kinds of shows, and had even seen one himself. They would claim that their mechanical contraption could somehow play chess and beat even the best grandmasters without any human assistance. But the detective knew their secret. Inside was a person, cleverly hidden in such a way that you'd have no idea from the outside. But there was always someone in there, pulling on strings or levers to manipulate the machinery as the crowd looked on amazed at the feats technology was capable of. And who better to hide inside one of these charlatan boxes than a small girl who had already shown an incredible aptitude for chess. Two girls were even better than one. They could work together or take turns playing in shifts. The detective had the feeling in his gut that had yet to be wrong. The girls were in that machine. The detective enters the tent housing the automaton, but is stopped at the entrance and told that he has to pay if he wants to see. The smoky, lamp-lit tent is crowded with men all huddled around something in the center. A burst of cheers come from the throng, and again the man demands payment for entrance, poking the detective in the chest, telling him he has to pay or get out. The detective asks if he's the owner of the machine, but the man says he's just the exhibitor. He again stresses that the man has to pay or he'll be forced to leave, again punctuating his point with a stern poke to the chest. As the man pokes the detective again, though, the detective grabs his hand and twists his arm behind his back. He asks again who the owner of the machine is, but the exhibitor, through gritted teeth, tells him he really doesn't know. He only communicates through letters and doesn't know the owner's real name, or even what he looks like. The detective shoves the man aside and heads deeper into the tent. He enters the crowd of men, pushing them aside, and finally sees what everyone has been so amazed by. There in the middle of the room is a chessboard on top of a steel table connected to a small steam engine. Sitting next to the table is a stationary suit of samurai armor, and across from that is a Russian man who appears to be deep in thought. He is playing chess, and his game against the samurai does not look to be going well. The detective sees the man make his move, and then, almost instantaneously, a piece moves by itself across the board in response. The man buries his head in his hands. Checkmate. The crowd erupts in cheers as the detective makes his way to the table. The exhibitor is rushing towards him, trying to stop the detective as he inspects the samurai suit. The suit falls to the ground. It's empty. The exhibitor is pulling on the detective, pleading with him to leave. The detective knows the girls are in here, though. If not in the suit of armor, then under the table itself. The detective grabs the chessboard and pulls. To his surprise, it comes off easily. And underneath is machinery. A complicated series of tubes, magnets, and gears whir and hum with electric current. The detective can hardly comprehend what he's looking at until he spots it. There in the middle of the machinery are two glass jars connected to the rest of the device by wires. There's a pink blob of organic material in each jar brain matter, and they are labeled with the missing girls' names. This is SCP-1875, also known as the Antique Chess Computer. 
SCP-1875 is a chess automaton from the Victorian period that is made up of four main components, the first of which, SCP-1875-1, is a steel table measuring 72 cm by 72 cm by 64 cm, with a standard 8x8 chessboard painted on top. Inside the steel box is a sophisticated piece of machinery that combines mechanical and biological elements. The movement of the pieces comes by way of magnets, with the moves themselves appearing to be decided by an analytical engine. Integrated into the analytical engine is brain tissue from the twin 14-year-old daughters of a Russian chess prodigy who went missing during the 19th century and were never found. The pieces, which have been designated SCP-18752, form a standard 32-piece chess set and are carved in an oriental style. The pieces have magnetic bases, and the tops have been identified as being carved human bone and genetically matching the brain tissue in the machine. SCP-18753 is a small steam engine with variable speeds that is connected to the machine via a drive shaft. SCP-18754 is a suit of 18th century Gusoku-style samurai armor. The armor appears to have no actual connection to the machine, mechanical or otherwise, and it now seems as though the armor was merely a prop, though multiple Foundation researchers have reported feeling a sense of unease and anxiety after making eye contact with the suit's mask. SCP-1875 continues to be fully operational and even has adjustable difficulty levels depending on which speed the steam engine is set to. To test the chess playing abilities of the machine, a D-Class personnel was seated at the machine across from the samurai and moves that were decided by chess software were broadcast into the room. Games were played on each of the machine's five settings and the chess software was used to measure SCP-1875's estimated rating on the ELO system which is a method used to calculate the relative skill of players, with a higher number being better. At the first setting, the machine exhibited a chess playing ability that would be rated in the 800 to 1000 range, which would be the equivalent of someone who knew how to move the pieces correctly, but otherwise was laughably bad. The second setting produced a result closer to 1200, which would put it firmly in the novice category. The third setting improved the automaton's ability to anywhere between a 1200 and 2500 rating which meant that it could perform like an amateur all the way up to a master level. The fourth setting, though, was where the machine became truly incredible and operated above a 2500 ELO rating. At that level, it would play like a chess grandmaster and sometimes operated at a level higher than any human has ever been recorded. The fifth and final setting was baffling, though. The machine would play erratically, sometimes at a level even higher than that measured on the fourth setting but then in the next game would make nonsensical decisions or look like it was trying to lose, sometimes even making moves that were illegal. Multiple games were played at this setting and the amount of illogical moves only increased. The pieces began to move faster and faster, and eventually they began to ram together until several were chipped. The testing was quickly halted after this and further tests were suspended until a way to test without potentially damaging the pieces was found. Following this bizarre result, something even stranger happened. Five minutes after the test, an email was received by all members of the SCP-1875 email distribution list. The message, which appeared to come from a research analyst involved with 1875 research, consisted only of a single image, which has been classified as it is suspected of having dangerous memetic properties. Multiple members of staff opened the email leading them to unintentionally view the attached image, and soon after reported numerous symptoms. They would immediately begin feeling anxiety, followed by a headache and fever. Two hours after viewing the image, they would begin feeling restless, unable to sleep, and hear auditory hallucinations. After four hours, visual hallucinations would begin as well. After seven hours, while still awake, they'd be exhibiting less and less response to stimuli. After 11 hours, there would be only brief periods of lucidity during which the afflicted person would appear to recover completely and immediately demand access to the computer on which they originally observed the image. After 12 hours, well, it only gets worse from there. SCP-1875 has been classified as Euclid, and the most important aspect of its containment is that it never comes within transmission range of a wireless data network of any kind. To help ensure this, the anomaly is kept contained within a Faraday cage at all times, and a network security expert is always on site. 
During testing, the steam engine's speed is only to be placed on one of the first four settings, and never the fifth. This rule became necessary following a test at the fifth level, after which a laptop computer was introduced into the Faraday cage to see if new research material would be transferred onto the computer similar to how the mimetic image appeared. It seems, though, that the laptop used was somehow infected and spread its virus to the entirety of the site's computer networks. All electronic communications with the facility were strictly forbidden by the O5 Council itself, which shows just how dangerous this could be. No electronic communications of any kind would be allowed until it can be determined just how SCP-1875 is transmitting its extremely dangerous mimetic image, and how it can be prevented. In the future, should any staff come to unintentionally view or open an email that contains shachmate.exe, they are to immediately… Mm. Ah. Ah, what happened? No, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, are we still recording? Yeah, no, I can take it from… Uh... The girl sighs and slumps in her seat kicking at the back of the bucket seat in front of her. Her mother, sitting in the car's front passenger side seat, doesn't even notice. She's too busy taking photographs out the window and chattering with her husband, who's driving the car. That's all they've been doing all day, and the girl is sick to death of it. Her parents dragged her on this stupid vacation trip, and now she's got to waste her whole summer away from her friends. She stares out the window and watches the pastoral countryside slide past. The quaint little villages and rolling hillsides really excite her parents, but she could not care less. Mom and Dad planned this family vacation across Europe for months, but she would much rather have gone someplace interesting instead. There are only so many boring old castles and stupid cathedrals that you can look at before you just lose your mind. The girl sighs and crosses her arms across her chest in silent resignation. Guess we're just gonna look at more dumb buildings, she mutters. Honey, can you stop that? Your father worked really hard to put this trip together, and the least you could do is pretend to have a good time," says her mother, momentarily lowering her camera to berate her ungrateful daughter. Huh? It's the first time that her mother has acknowledged her all day. I think you're really gonna like today's itinerary, says her father, grinning as if he's got a delicious secret that he can't wait to share. We know it's been hard for you spending your whole summer away from home, so today we're gonna do something just for you. Uh-huh, says the girl. Sure, Dad. She rolls her eyes and pulls out a cell phone. At least she can still get internet access out here. Desperate for something to distract her from the monotony of this car trip, she quickly scrolls through her feed and reads all the notes that her friends back home are posting. She frowns. Her classmates are all posting about the latest blockbuster film in the girl's favorite media franchise, Vampire Boyfriend. She grits her teeth. She likes to consider herself a Vampire Boyfriend superfan. She's a well-known poster in the Vampire Boyfriend online community, famous for her fanfiction as well as her own original character, Vampire Girlfriend. In fact, her writing is somewhat controversial. A lot of Vampire Boyfriend purists have accused her character Vampire Girlfriend of being a Mary Sue, and they object to her stories where Vampire Boyfriend meets and falls madly in love with her, to the point that he forgets his canon lover from the film series, Vampire Wife. She's annoyed to see that her friends got to see the new Vampire Boyfriend movie on opening night, while she's stuck out here on this stupid family vacation. The movie won't premiere in Europe for another few months, and there's no way she's going to be able to avoid spoilers for that long. Everything about this situation seems tailor-made to irritate her, and the excited giggles of her parents in the front of the car as they <laughs> exchange knowing glances are only annoying her more. Trust me, you're gonna love this, says her father again. He peers at an unfolded roadmap in his lap, mutters something under his breath, and turns the car off the main highway and onto a narrow gravel road. The girl grits her teeth as the car rattles over the uneven ground so hard that it nearly jostles her cell phone from her grasp. She tries to distract herself by typing some notes to herself, plot points for the latest Vampire Boyfriend fanfiction that she's working on. In her new story, Vampire Girlfriend is going to be kidnapped by werewolves, leading Vampire Boyfriend to have an existential crisis as he struggles to find meaning in a world without his beloved. She makes a note that Vampire Girlfriend should look, dress, and talk just like her. After all, she imagines, wouldn't she be the perfect match for Vampire Boyfriend? She pauses, a momentary, dreamy expression on her face, as she imagines how much better a weekend together with Vampire Boyfriend would be compared to this boring car trip. This can't be right, mumbles her father, scanning the horizon. But the directions said. Suddenly he brightens up. Oh, there it is. Playland! The girl cranes her neck to see that the car is fast approaching what appears to be a little carnival at the end of the road. 
She rolls her eyes. Oh, great. Of course, her parents would take her here. First, they bore her with endless visits to museums and historical sites, and now, when they want to make it all up to her, they take her to a carnival for babies. She's not a kid anymore, but her parents still think that this sort of goofy nonsense should excite her. I know you've been bored going to all the historical sites with us, Honey Pumpkin, says her father as he pulls the car into a parking spot and applies the brake. That's why I asked the hotel concierge if there was anything good around here for kids. And wouldn't you know it? The next morning, what did I find shoved under our door? Three free tickets. He holds up the tickets as if they were a trophy he'd won. The girl's mother nods approvingly. Now that's good service. I hope you left him a big tip. The girl groans. You can't be serious, Dad. A carnival? What, do you expect me to ride on the teacups or something? I'm 15. I'm not a dumb baby anymore. Language, young lady, admonishes her mother as she unbuckles her seatbelt. Your father worked really hard to find this place just for you. The least you could do is show a little gratitude for once. Oh, you think you're too old now, says her father. But I bet once we see some of these rides, boy, I'll bet you feel just like a kid again. He inhales deeply. Even inside the car, the unmistakable fair smells of funnel cake and corn dogs are in the air. You smell that? It smells like fun. Sure, fun. The girl pockets her cell phone. The family exits the car and walks toward the Playland gate, where they're greeted by a costumed employee. Welcome to Playland, announces the employee in a chipper voice. Your favorite amusement park. When you're at Playland, you'll find that the worries of the day melt away, and it's time for play. Oh, you speak English, says the father. He turns to the mother. See, now that's service. He hands over the complimentary tickets. The employee takes them with a smile and a flourish, and then ushers the family through the gate. The girl, however, can't stop staring at the gatekeeper. If she didn't know any better, she would think that he was dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. But that doesn't make any sense. It must just be a coincidence. But once they enter the park, she sees that all the employees are dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. The guy standing behind the counter of the ring toss booth, the guy manning the balloon station. The uniform for this park looks like the outfit that she imagined Vampire Boyfriend would be wearing in her first fanfiction story. Wait, says the girl, staring up at the bundle of helium balloons floating above the balloon vendor. Each balloon bears the name Vampire Boyfriend and the fanged bat logo of the film series. So it's not a coincidence at all? This theme park really is themed after her favorite films? Her father notices her change of expression, and he nudges her in the ribs. Eh? Eh? I told you that you like it. This is all about those movies you like so much, huh? Ghost Boyfriend or whatever? It's Vampire Boyfriend, Dad, she says distantly, but she's too mesmerized by her surroundings to put much feeling into the barb. How much for a balloon? asks her father, pulling open his wallet and quickly thumbing through a stack of local currency. Oh, no charge, says the balloon vendor brightly. He plucks a string from the bundle and hands it over. Everything's free for our valued special ticket holders. Well, would you listen to that, says her father. He replaces his wallet in his back pocket. Now, this is the kind of carnival that I wish we had back in the States. The girl awkwardly takes the proffered balloon. She feels silly holding it, but she's more confused about why it's free. The whole point of offering free entry into a carnival is to gouge people with overpriced rides and souvenirs, right? But everywhere she looks, she can't help but notice signs advertising free corn dogs and bumper cars, unlimited rides for zero dollars. How can this carnival make enough money to keep operating if it's not charging for anything? In fact, how can this carnival make enough money to keep operating when it's based around a niche film like Vampire Boyfriend? Are there really that many Vampire Boyfriend fans out here to keep this place in business? Not that there's anyone else around. As she scans her surroundings, she realizes that, while there are plenty of costume employees bustling around the fair, she doesn't see any other fair goers. It's as if this whole carnival was created and maintained solely for her benefit. Hey, Pumpkin, how about a ride? I bet you'd love to try out some bumper cars, huh? Says her father. How about we go for a race and you can see if you can beat your old man, huh? He points to a bumper car ride across the midway. The girl stares. Like all the other rides, it's covered in vampire boyfriend murals. This one depicts a young woman running away from a pack of werewolves, and the young woman looks exactly like the girl. It couldn't be. But there's no other explanation. The young woman in the mural matches exactly the description of the girl's character Vampire Girlfriend from her fanfiction story, and the image of the werewolves looks like it's an illustration of the scene where Vampire Girlfriend gets kidnapped. How could this be? Could it be that the artist, obviously a fan of the Vampire Boyfriend films, is also familiar with her fanfiction? But even if that was the case, it's absurd to think that he would use it as an inspiration for a theme park ride. Who other than her would possibly recognize this scene? Hmm, says the girl's mother, walking up behind her and peering at the mural. Why, that girl looks just like you. I know, she does, says the girl quickly. 
It's almost a relief to know that her mother has also noticed the resemblance. At least it means that she's not imagining things. At the same time, she feels a twinge of guilt. Readers online are always accusing her of using Vampire Girlfriend as a thinly disguised self-insert. Seeing this larger-than-life picture of Vampire Girlfriend makes her think that there might be some merit to the accusation. Come on, you lot, stop worrying about some old picture and let's have some fun, says her father. He offers money to the ticket taker parked behind the kiosk, but the man merely shakes his head. Your money is no good here, sir, says the ticket taker. The bumper cars are free for our favored guests today. Their father clambers into the rink and ambles toward a bumper car. Her mother tugs at the girl's arm as if to encourage her to join in, but the girl resists. Come on, what's gotten into you? says her mother. This place is just weird, says the girl. Like, half of the stuff here isn't even from the official vampire boyfriend lore. It's all stuff that I made up for my stories. Her mother rolls her eyes in annoyance. Really, we go to all this trouble to find something that you would like to do, and all you want to do is complain? I'm sorry, ma'am, is there some problem here? The family is startled as another employee walks up to them. He's also dressed like vampire boyfriend, and a wide smile is plastered across his face. You folks look like you're upset about something. You're damn right I'm upset about something, yells the girl. In her rage, she throws her drink at the employee. He barely reacts as the cup explodes against his chest, dousing him with sticky soda. What's going on here? Where did you hear about Vampire Girlfriend? Ma'am, Playland is designed to give every visitor the perfect experience, says the employee blandly. That's not good enough. Tell me what's going on here. The employee's attitude changes on a dime. His bright smile fades, and suddenly his tone turns stern. Ma'am, I'm afraid that you're going to ruin everyone's fun if you keep up this sort of behavior. We like to keep things fun here at Playland. If you want to spoil the fun, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. Fine, then we'll leave. Oh, come on, young lady, we just got here, snaps her mother. We literally drove all day to get here and you want to leave after just one ride? You don't even like rides. There's a principle involved here, says her father sternly as he saunters up. Young lady, if that's your attitude, then I think maybe you should go wait in the car, because your mother and I intend to have a good time. The girl doesn't have a chance to argue. The employee rests his hands heavily on her shoulders and turns her around. Don't worry, folks. We'll escort her back to your car. You can join her as well when you're ready. The girl cannot believe what's happening. The employee politely but firmly steers her toward the exit, and Frog marches her out the gate. He abandons her in the parking lot, tipping his hat and smiling brightly before he disappears back inside the park. Please try to enjoy yourself, ma'am, until your parents are ready to join you. In the meantime, why don't you work on that new fanfiction you've been planning? How do you know about that? yells the girl. The employee doesn't answer, simply turning and fading back into the crowd. She rushes to the gate, but the gatekeeper stops her. Sorry, ma'am, no re-entry without a ticket. But I have a ticket, she cries. You saw it, my dad gave it to you like half an hour ago. Come on, you can't be serious. She tries to push past him, but the gatekeeper grabs her wrists with surprising strength and holds her. Still smiling, he firmly escorts her back out to her car before releasing her. Please, ma'am, don't make a scene. You're going to disturb our guests. Who's in charge here? I, I need to talk to the manager. I want my parents back right now. The gatekeeper doesn't even respond. He simply returns to his station. There's nothing that the girl can do now but wait. She sits down in the gravel and leans her back against the side of the car. Minutes turn to hours, and still her parents haven't returned. Eventually, she goes back to yell at the gatekeeper again. Where are my parents? They should have been back hours ago. Sorry, ma'am. I guess your parents are just having too much fun right now. I'm sure you'll see them again soon, though, says the gatekeeper. The girl shivers as she feels a bite in the cool twilight air. She notices that the sun is starting to dip behind the mountains. It'll be dark soon. How much longer could they take? Even if they decided to ride on every ride in the park, surely they would be done by now. What time does the park close? Asks the girl, a note of panic rising in her voice. The gatekeeper blinks serenely. Playland is open 24-7, ma'am. We're always here when you want to play. The girl feels the color drain from her face as she ponders the possibilities. Her father has the car keys, so she can't take the car to go for help. She pulls out her cell phone, but she doesn't know the number she would need to alert any local authorities. And it's not like she speaks the language anyway. Other than the employees here at Playland, she hasn't met a single person in this whole trip who speaks English. She's completely helpless, trapped, and there's nothing that she can do except wait and hope. As the night settles in, she realizes that her wait might have just started. <laughs> it might not be the happiest place on Earth, but it definitely tries to be. And while the world is full of sketchy amusement parks, most of them just want your money. The amusement park known as SCP-1357, however, 
genuinely wants you to have a good time. Sometimes it wants you to have a good time, whether you want to or not. SCP-1357 is a theme park with an area of approximately 4 square kilometers, located somewhere in Poland. The park has four entrances, at each of the cardinal directions. SCP-1357 is highly selective about who it allows to enter the park, restricting access to parties that meet the following criteria. The group must contain at least two adults in a romantic relationship. It must contain at least one member who is under the age of 18 and who thinks of the aforementioned romantic couple as their guardians. And every member of the party must possess a free ticket, hereafter referred to as SCP-1357-B. The park does not charge for admission, and the only way to gain access is to have possession of an instance of SCP-1357-B. Once inside, SCP-1357 looks like any other carnival, with thrill rides, amusement arcades, midway games, and concession booths. Highly unusual for a carnival, though, is that SCP-1357 does not accept any money. All rides, food, and souvenirs are free. The layout and theme of the park are different for different visitors and appear to be highly contingent on the desires of the youngest member of any visiting party. Often, the park will appear themed after various popular media properties, such as Batman, Winnie the Pooh, or Barney the Dinosaur. However, visiting parties accompanied by more imaginative kids may encounter substantially weirder things in the park, including talking animals, sentient foodstuffs, temporal displacements, and even extra-dimensional portals. Although the park normally sits empty, when a group meeting entry requirements arrive at the gate, SCP-1357 will spontaneously manifest a full working staff, people designated as SCP-1357-A. Instances of SCP-1357-A appear to be ordinary humans of various ages, ethnicities, sexes, and genders, all clothed in matching uniforms, suggesting that they are employees of the park. Instances of SCP-1357-A are exceptionally friendly and helpful and are extremely dedicated to making sure that visitors to SCP-1357 have a good time. In fact, there's nothing that they care about more. There is, however, a darker side to SCP-1357, and one incident suggests the frightening lengths to which the park will go to make sure that its younger visitors truly enjoy their stay. As part of an experiment, a Foundation agent visited the park with his own family, each member equipped with audio recording devices that continuously transmitted to Foundation consoles. During his stay, he attempted to interrogate an instance of SCP-1357-A. The instance of SCP-1357-A refused to answer the agent's questions about the purpose or origin of the park, instead lamenting that the agent's attitude was going to spoil the fun for his family. Eventually, instances of SCP-1357-A escorted the agent to an exit and forcibly removed him from the park. When his wife attempted to follow him, the couple's daughter refused to leave. Instances of SCP-1357-A separated the daughter from her family, removing the wife from the park and keeping the daughter inside, leaving the parents with only vague assurances that their daughter would be returned when she was ready to leave the park. Attempts to forcibly recover the daughter proved futile, and even a well-armed rescue team was unable to overcome the seemingly infinite numbers of SCP-1357-A that SCP-1357 manifested to protect itself. Hopes that SCP-1357 might indeed allow the daughter to leave when she became bored with the park attractions also proved to be futile. Audio captured from the daughter's recording device seems to indicate that when she eventually demanded that SCP-1357-As release her, she was instead placed into some sort of machine that altered or brainwashed her into becoming an SCP-1357-A herself. Subsequent park visits by Foundation researchers have revealed a new SCP-1357-A that matches the daughter's physical description but does not display any memories of her past life. Interactions with the SCP-1357-A that resembles the missing daughter reveal that, like other instances of SCP-1357-A, her only thoughts are on how to please park visitors and help them enjoy a pleasant visiting experience. In the end, Playland may offer the ultimate amusement park experience for free but it might still exact a price that's way too high. Everyone in this school knows to step aside when the goth girl is on the move. She strides down the school hallway, confident that no one will challenge her as the undisputed ruler of this high school. It's not just her dark wardrobe or her black nails and eyeliner that intimidate the other students. Her domineering attitude and sharp tongue make her feared. She brushes past a gaggle of underclassmen who wilt under her devastating gaze, Beat it, dorks, she hisses, jerking her head to indicate that they should get out of her way. The other students disperse instantly, afraid the chance really getting an earful. 
Her terrible reputation means that no one ever makes trouble for the goth girl, but it's more than just her attitude that keeps her on top. It's also all those rumors around her. The rumors started last year, just after a new transfer student arrived in their school. She was a younger classman who shared the goth girl's same dark fashion sense and sensibilities. Students even saw the younger girl occasionally hanging out with the school's resident goth population. But it was no secret that the goth girl didn't like her. Maybe she felt like this younger girl was homing in on her territory or even angling to take her place among the goth crew. Whatever the case, other students couldn't help but notice how the goth girl's lip quivered or her eyes flashed whenever the younger girl tried to worm her way into the goth gang's meetups. Then, one day, the younger girl didn't come home from school. The younger girl's parents reported her missing and organized a whole search party. The police spent weeks tracking down every lead, desperately looking for anything that might tell them what became of the missing girl, but found nothing. Rumors spread around school that the goth girl had something to do with it. After all, hadn't the younger girl been her biggest rival? Hadn't she always hated the younger girl? And if anyone at this school would have had the chutzpah to actually do something sinister, it would be her, right? Despite all the gossip, though, no evidence ever surfaced to link the goth girl to the disappearance. The police even interviewed her several times, but she always denied knowing anything. Yeah, I didn't like that little brat, she said in the police interview. She was always getting underfoot and thinking that she could hang with us. But that doesn't mean I did anything to her. I mean, it's not like I would have really wanted to hurt her. The goth girl concluded her statement with a knowing smirk, as if she was pleased with herself for getting away with murder. But you can't build a case out of a smirk. So even if the police suspected anything, they were forced to let her go. Eventually, life at school returned to normal. Other than a few fading missing child posters still fixed to telephone poles around town, most students eventually forgot about their missing classmate. But the goth girl's fearsome reputation persisted. Could she have actually had something to do with that younger girl's mysterious disappearance? Now that other students thought she might have actually killed someone, they naturally found her even more intimidating. The goth girl didn't mind, though. After all, she already thought most of the other students were normie losers anyway, so she liked that they gave her a wide berth. The goth girl walks toward the end of the hallway, pushing open a designated fire exit door and slipping out behind the school. Today, the other goths are hanging out behind the school building. They nod curtly as the goth girl joins them. What's going on, losers? She says, adopting an aura of bored detachment. I was just telling them that there's this haunted game you can download, says the goth boy. It's all messed up, like... The game knows all your worst secrets, and the more you play, the more it taunts you. Then, when you finish, you just disappear. The other goths snicker at the story. None of them really believe it, but it makes for a fun, spooky tale to help set the atmosphere as the sun sets. But one girl is more skeptical than the rest, to the point that she's almost insulted by how obviously fake this story is. What do you mean you just disappear? asks the girl. The boy shrugs. I don't know. I just know that no one ever sees them again. I don't believe that at all, says the goth girl. That sounds made up. No, no, says the boy. It's 100% real. It's called the Book of Tamlin. Okay, sure, whatever you say. And who exactly is Tamlin? The boy shrugs. I don't know. Clearly, I haven't played it since I'm still here. The girl rolls her eyes. That's ridiculous. I'll show you right now. She whips her cell phone out of her backpack and starts to thumb through the app store until she sees it. The Book of Tamlin. It's right there in the store. That just makes this whole story seem even sillier. She would expect that if there were a real haunted app. It would only be accessible via the dark web or maybe a strange glitch that randomly installed it into doomed victims' phones. But it's right here for anyone to download. With a skeptical smirk on her face, she punches the button to begin the installation. It's right here in the app store, says the goth girl. Any of you chickens gonna play? The other goths eye each other nervously. Sure, they were all pretty quick to dismiss the ominous story about this weird game before. But now that their friend is challenging them to actually play it, they don't feel quite so confident. The goth girl snorts derisively. She wonders why she bothers hanging out with these posers. They're the closest thing that she has to friends, since so few other students even dare approach her. But what does a bossy prima donna like her really need with friends anyway? She watches as the game loads up the intro screen, and then gameplay begins. She snorts again. The Book of Tamlin appears to be a hidden object game where the point is to discover various objects hidden in a larger image. This is baby stuff, thinks the goth girl. Find the ten black cats in the cemetery, instructs the game as it pulls up a cartoony image of a graveyard. 
The goth girl's finger hovers over the screen, and she quickly taps it whenever she spots a black cat crouching behind one of the pixelated tombstones. Is this supposed to be scary? The screen fades, and an empty room with a pair of doors fades in. The goth girl intuits that she's supposed to pick one to advance to the next screen. Rolling her eyes, she selects the door on the left. The next scene looks familiar. Too familiar. It's a bedroom. Her bedroom, in fact. She recognizes the dark decor and the black clothing thrown on the floor. She narrows her eyes suspiciously. Surely that's just a crazy coincidence, right? She eyes the other goths, but they don't give any indication that they were expecting this twist. Are they playing a trick on her? Find the outfits that make your parents ashamed to be seen with you, says the instructions. She grits her teeth. What's the deal with this stupid program insulting her? She knows that her parents don't exactly approve of her fashion choices, but this stupid game can't know that. It's probably just guessing that any young person who plays a game will probably have had quarrels with their parents about the way they dress. That's pretty normal, right? Again, the empty room with the two doors appears. This time, the goth girl chooses the one on the right. The next screen after that is a picture of a pretty garden, and the instructions say to pick out ten pretty flowers. The next is a barnyard, with instructions to find five cows. The goth girl starts to relax. That weird screen with her room must have just been a fluke. Otherwise, this game seems pretty mundane. But the next screen makes the goth girl's face go as white as a sheet. Her eyes bug out of her head, and sweat starts to beat on her forehead. No. No way. There's no way that this next screen could be real. The image that appears is familiar to her. It's a real-life place. She knows, because she's been there. It's an image of a particular ravine deep in the local woods. People sometimes throw old garbage down there, so it's full of old washing machines and wrecked cars. Years ago, an old oak tree fell across the chasm, and now the dead log functions as a makeshift bridge. Sometimes kids dare one another to cross it. The instructions read, Find the girl who wanted to be a part of your club. The goth girl doesn't need to search the image to know what she'll find. She knows, deep in her heart, that the hidden object that she's being instructed to find will be a broken body lying at the bottom of the ditch, half hidden under old blankets and debris. How could this game know? She was so careful. She remembers last school year when that younger girl kept trying to usurp her place in her clique. It made her so mad. But that younger girl seemed to look up to her, to think of her as the leader of the group and the one who she needed to impress in order to be accepted. That was good. The goth girl knew she could use that to her advantage. She told the younger girl to meet her in the woods by the old ravine late at night. Of course, it was nothing sinister. It was just for a little initiation test to prove that the younger girl could take her place as part of their gang. The younger girl was only too excited for her test. The goth girl was waiting at the ravine when her younger rival finally arrived. I came as fast as I could, said the younger girl. What do you need me to do? Listen, I see how you want to hang out with us, said the goth girl. But you have to prove yourself if you want to be part of our group. But you have to understand, us goths, we embrace the darkness. We're not scared of the void. We only take the coolest and the bravest, the kids who aren't afraid of death. So you have to show me that you're willing to look eternity in the eye. All you have to do to join us is to cross this ravine over that log over there. She pointed at the fallen log. The younger girl looked frightened, but she nodded. The goth girl half expected her to turn tail and run home, but she was surprised to see her rival make her way toward the log. Maybe she wasn't as much of a poser as the goth girl thought. The goth girl didn't mean for anything bad to happen. She really only wanted to scare the younger girl. Maybe she could freak her out enough that she wouldn't want to hang out with them anymore and then she wouldn't have to deal with that little pest anymore. The younger girl clambers up atop the log and slowly starts walking across the deep gorge, carefully placing one foot in front of the other. But the peeling bark of the old log is more slippery than it looks, and it's hard to keep her footing in the dark. The younger girl makes it almost halfway across the ravine before she loses her footing. With a yelp, she lurches to the side and falls down the slope, tumbling head over heels and landing amongst the garbage with a sickening crunch. The goth girl screamed in shock. She stared down in the ravine, seeing the younger girl lying still at the bottom, her neck bent at an impossible angle. It was obvious that the fall had killed her instantly. The goth girl knew she was in trouble. Or was she? Nobody knew she was out here. Nobody knew that she'd asked the younger girl to meet her here. All she had to do was keep her mouth shut, and nobody could pin this on her. The plan worked. She worked out her alibi and stuck to it during all the police interviews, never deviating, practicing her story until it sounded natural. The cops fell for it, clearing her as a suspect before moving on in their investigation. 
For a whole year, she had carried this terrible secret. Of course, it got easier over time. She gradually convinced herself that the whole thing was a terrible accident. It couldn't have been prevented. She had nothing to feel guilty about. And yet, somehow, this game knew. This game knew exactly what she had done. The phone slips from her palsied fingers and drops to the ground. The other Goths look at her in confusion. They've never seen their leader in such a state of terror. What could have spooked her so bad? Which of you made this dumb game? She snaps. It must have been one of you. Fess up. We don't know what you're talking about, says the goth boy. I already told you, it's supposed to be haunted and... I don't know what you think you know, but you don't know anything, shouts the goth girl, hysterical in her fear. Has she been found out? Was this entire game just an elaborate ruse to trick her into confessing her guilt? Well, she's not going to fall for it. She's still the queen boss of this school, and if any of these losers think that they can knock her off her perch with a silly game, they're dead wrong. What do you mean we don't know anything? The other goths are murmuring amongst themselves. Of course, they'd heard the rumors about their leader as well, but they never really gave them much credence. She may be a little sharp, but that doesn't make her capable of murder. But the way that this game had freaked her out so much is really beginning to make them wonder. The goth girl is frantic now, seeing her control slip away as the other kids begin to mull the possibilities. She can't believe this. She wonders desperately if someone was there that night to see the whole terrible accident play out. Or maybe she let something slip without knowing. What other explanation could there possibly be? I'm out of here. Leave me alone. Don't follow me, she yells as she stomps away. The other goths don't make any move to follow, intimidated by the wrath of their leader. But when the goth girl throws open the door to head back inside the school, she's confronted with an unexpected sight. Instead of the long gray hallway lined with lockers that she expected, she instead sees a single empty room. It couldn't be, but it looks exactly like the empty room from the game, the one that she glimpsed between levels. This isn't supposed to be here, she cries. Behind her, the other goths stare in confusion. They too recognize the room from the game, but they can't figure out for the life of them how it's managed to appear in real life. What's going on? Is her guilty mind playing tricks on her? No, that can't be. The reaction of the other goths shows that they see it too. She doesn't think she can trust her senses, but she also feels an overwhelming urge to step into that empty room. Don't go in, calls the goth boy, but it's too late. Internally, her rational mind is screaming at her to stay out, but she can't control her feet. She steps inside, and the door swings closed behind her. The goth boy runs to the door and yanks it open, hoping to help his terrified friend. But beyond the door, he sees nothing but the ordinary hallway that's always been there. The mysterious empty room is nowhere to be seen, and the goth girl has completely vanished with it. Not many people would say that SCP-1590, better known as the Book of Tamlin, is any fun. SCP-1590 is a downloadable app that has been designated as Euclid, and seven copies of the game are currently held by the Foundation in a containment locker for experimentation purposes. Whenever the Foundation discovers new instances of SCP-1590, information technicians initiate an immediate DDoS attack on the hosting server, and an MTF is to be sent in to appropriate all hardware. Any systems that were able to download copies of the game before the DDoS attack should be infected with the COM AMA computer virus to prevent unwitting innocents from playing the game. SCP-1590 is a one kilobyte program or application designed for use with touchscreen hardware such as tablets. Attempts to view SCP-1590's coding reveal only the numbers 1 through 66,666 in numerical order, but on the front end, SCP-1590 plays as a mostly ordinary video game in the hidden object puzzle genre. Like other hidden object puzzle games, the player is given a list of objects that they must find in a scene within an allotted amount of time. What makes SCP-1590 unusual, though? is that as the game progresses, the scenes and hidden objects become more personal to the player, often referencing traumatic or unsettling events from the player's life. It is not known how SCP-1590 is able to gain such intimate knowledge of a player, but since some players report that SCP-1590 seems privy to personal secrets that have never been revealed to another person, it is unlikely that it's just due to very good research on the part of the game's designers. The game always begins with the same dedication screen, containing the message, To Joey, who taught me how to be cool. The dedication continues, listing another name who almost made it out. The second name changes with every playthrough, but is always the name of the previous person to play the game. The dedication screen is followed by an animated cutscene with a humanoid silhouette standing on the deck of what appears to be an oil tanker. The screen turns bright white, 
then returns to the oil tanker. A yellow wall, larger than the ship, has been added to the scene. The wall's appearance causes a wave to crash over the ship, waving the humanoid overboard. The screen fills with bubbles, and the words, The Book of Tamlin and Start Game appear overhead on the bubbles. The significance of this animated sequence, as well as the title, The Book of Tamlin, if any, is currently unknown. When a player chooses Start Game, the title screen fades into an image of a cluttered room. The user is presented with a series of tasks, directing them to find objects hidden in the room image. The allotted time to find every object in a scene ranges from 1 to 12 minutes. Once the user finds every object in a scene, a set of doors appear on screen, and the player must choose one to progress in the game. The game continues through a random number of screens, labeled from 7 to 43. Eventually, if the user fails to find all objects in a scene within the time limit, the next scene will be an empty room. The words, you've found out everything there is to find about the house, now all you have left to find is the way out, appear on the screen. At this point, the game ends and cannot be replayed by the same user. The actual length of the game appears to vary from player to player, but even players who appear to win the game, always finding all hidden objects within the time limit, will eventually be shown the same end screen and receive the same message. As strange as the game is, what happens next is even stranger. Within 72 hours of completing the game, whether a player has ostensibly won or lost, the player will encounter the final room from the game in real life. They will find that some ordinary door, possibly in their home or workplace, no longer leads to the room it should lead to, but instead leads to the empty room from the end of the game. If someone other than the player attempts to pass through the door, they will find themselves not in the empty room from the game, but instead in the room that the door normally leads to. If the player passes through the door, though, they disappear into the empty room. Any tracking devices cease to transmit after the user passes through the doorway. The Foundation currently has no idea who or what is behind SCP-1590 or how the game manages to access users' memories. It's also not clear what purpose the game solves, whether it's intended as a therapy device to help subjects work through hidden trauma or as an instrument of justice to punish wrongdoing. Either way, you might want to make sure you have a clean conscience before you download any new mysterious games for your phone. You never know when you might find yourself confronting the Book of Tamlin. It began, as most bad things do, with the evil mechanizations of one Dr. Evo Robotnik. This rotund mad scientist had been terrorizing the world of Sonic the Hedgehog and his animal friends for decades, with a single-minded task motivating his every diabolical action getting his hands on the Chaos Emeralds and the Master Emerald that controls their power. This would allow him to strangle the natural beauty of the world around him and develop it into a cold, unfeeling world of machinery. None would survive his terrible wrath. The problem was, by this point, far too many people had, in fact, survived his terrible wrath. For many, many years now, despite a multiplicity of evil plans, Sonic the Hedgehog and all his cool, superpowered animal friends had thwarted him countless times. No matter how ingenious his plots were, no matter how many or how powerful robots he built to fight on his behalf, he would always be defeated, and it was starting to get extremely frustrating. It was in this state of near-maddening rage and spite that Dr. Robotnik created what would soon become his most dangerous and deadly invention, a trans-dimensional snatcher, a device that would allow him to reach into other dimensions and pluck out dangerous beings beings that would become living weapons, tools in his arsenal to fight that blasted hedgehog and all the others. Little did he know, he was about to tangle with a creature far more dangerous than anything he could ever hope to be. His mouth twisted into a devious grin, Dr. Robotnik stood in front of the trans-dimensional snatcher with his finger poised over a big, red button. Yes, yes, this would be the perfect plan. Sonic would never stop him now. He pressed the button and watched as the machine gave a mighty, almost blinding flash. As the resulting smoke cleared, Dr. Robotnik saw the creature he'd summoned cowering on the platform before him. It was gray and emaciated, shivering and weeping, covering its face. Immediately, Dr. Robotnik's face fell. Was that it? Some weeping, stretched freak? He wanted something more exciting, like a giant killer lizard or monstrous zombie that melts everything it touches. What could possibly be the combat potential of this pathetic creature? In his frustration, Robotnik kicked the cowering beast. It would be the last mistake he'd ever made, because the creature in question was, as you'd probably guessed, SCP-096. 
And as any SCP Foundation enthusiast knows, there are two ways to activate 096's infamous rage state. One is looking at his face, and the other is attacking him. Dr. Robotnik had just made a literally fatal mistake. As the crying turned into wails of rage, 096 leaped onto him, freakishly stretching its bottom jaw into a yawning black chasm of a mouth. Nearby, Sonic the Hedgehog, who was, of course, gliding along at the speed of sound, heard Dr. Robotnik's horrific screaming. He immediately recognized the scream as that of his arch enemy, and yet, the scream was so blood-curdling that even he couldn't deny it made him concerned for his old foe. Thankfully, it didn't take the blue super speedster very long to investigate the source of Dr. Robotnik's death rattles. He ran at hypersonic speeds until he reached Dr. Robotnik's base, where an eerie silence had now fallen. Sonic felt a chill in the air. With uncharacteristic caution, he began creeping through the metal halls of Robotnik's lair. Soon enough, he started seeing blood on the walls. Blood, but no bodies. What had happened here? Soon after, Sonic found out. He walked into the room that had once been the home to the transdimensional Snatcher, where the shy guy sat crouched in the middle of an empty, bloody room, weeping. Something about all this was terribly wrong. Sonic could hear it. That's when one of his feet clanked against the metal floor, and the shy guy looked up to view him. Sonic almost felt the breath leave his body when he saw that monster's horrible face. He'd never seen anything like it before. That's when the thought crossed his mind. Had this monster murdered Dr. Robotnik? As though activated by the sudden intrusion, the shy guy gave a monstrous wail, then lunged towards Sonic. Luckily for Sonic, his incredible speed came in handy here, darting out of the monster's clutches and whizzing out of the base. But despite his speed, the shy guy somehow still seemed to have an innate sense of Sonic's location. It began to bound after him, tearing its way through the walls of the base like tissue paper. It would slaughter the strange blue creature that had seen its face, destroy it, and leave nothing left. Meanwhile, Sonic was already speeding away. His greatest asset had always been his truly supernatural speed, but he couldn't run forever. And one look over his shoulder revealed a distant white dot behind him. It couldn't be, could it? He was moving so fast that the normal eye couldn't perceive him, so how could any living being possibly even be that far behind him? This monster really is built different, huh? He said to himself. The shy guy was gaining speed behind him. He couldn't even see Sonic, but he could sense his distant presence, the one who'd looked at him, the source of his rage. This strange little blue creature was certainly fast, but unlike Sonic, 096 was literally incapable of getting tired. The turtle always beat the hare in the end, and it would be the same here eventually. Sonic was smart enough to know that he probably couldn't beat something like this in a fight, especially if it had literally annihilated Dr. Robotnik. If he had any hope of beating this beast, he'd need to get some friends on his side before things went truly south. The person Sonic was looking for here was Tails, a flying two-tailed fox who was also one of Sonic's closest friends, who lived in the Green Hill Zone. Tails, Tails! Sonic yelled at breakneck speed. What's wrong, Sonic? Tails asked, visibly concerned. No time to fully explain. There's something after me, some kind of monster, Sonic said. Get everyone you can. We're going to need all the help we can get if we want to stop this thing. Before Tails could even get another word in, Sonic tore off again in the opposite direction. If this thing was following him, he didn't want to lead him straight to Tails. But the last thing Sonic was expecting was that the monster had somehow closed the distance, and now it was heading right for him. Sonic didn't even have time to course correct. A long, wiry arm shot outwards and whacked Sonic in the side of the head, sending him skidding across the grass. The shock of an enemy catching up to him like this rattled him even more than the pain of the hit, but there was no time to dwell. Sonic looked up from the ground and saw the shy guy barreling towards him, bellowing madly and digging its claws into the dirt. You just don't know when to give up, do you? Sonic said. Just before the shy guy's claws reached him, Sonic darted out of the way at the speed of light. Even then, the shy guy seemingly had an innate sense of his location. There was no way to trick or outrun the shy guy. It just kept running, no matter what. It was utterly relentless. If Sonic wanted to survive while Tails found reinforcements, he needed to fight back. Before the shy guy could lunge for him, Sonic lunged for the shy guy at impossible speeds, kicking the monster in the chest with both feet. The force of the kick, charged by super speed, sent shy guy rolling back across the dirt. Sonic hoped that this attack might incapacitate it, but no. The shy guy immediately rose to its hands and feet. It was ready to go again. 
For the first time in quite some time, Sonic was afraid. Thankfully, this time, he wasn't alone. The shy guy prepared to lunge when a spiked fist collided with the side of his face, laying the beast out temporarily. It was Knuckles the Echidna, a powerful pugilist who also acted as the guardian of the Master Emerald, the Chaos Emerald that controlled all of the other Chaos Emeralds. If Knuckles punched you, then you better believe you're gonna feel it. Tails called me. Is this ugly punk giving you trouble, Sonic? Knuckles asked as the shy guy began getting back up, its semi-smashed face repairing itself. You have no idea, Sonic said. Sonic and Knuckles were now taking on the Shy Guy two-on-one, making things a little more even, but they were still up against a ruthless, savage killer without compare. And now, Knuckles had seen its face too. The Shy Guy leaped forward, trying to grab Knuckles with its grasping claws. Sonic darted in just in time and grabbed Knuckles out of the way. As the Shy Guy grasped at the empty air, Knuckles jumped in and gave the screaming monster another mighty punch. The sheer force of it left the creature wobbling on its feet, but it still wasn't enough. Lucky for Sonic and Knuckles, they were about to get some help from the big guns. Literally. Bullets suddenly perforated the Shy Guy's body, distracting the monster. It turned and saw yet another one of Sonic's allies, Shadow the Hedgehog, wielding a customized M16 assault rifle. He was wearing a devious smirk. Oh, Sonic, he said. When will you learn that your actions have consequences? Having attacked the Shy Guy, Shadow the Hedgehog was added to his kill list. It seemed he was making a lot of new enemies today in this strange new place. But there was still one more ally left to come. Suddenly, the Shy Guy felt a presence behind him, as though someone had just teleported there. It was a purple creature, similar to Sonic, though far more extreme, named Cold Steel the Hedgehog. He was wielding a desert eagle in each hand. Huh, nothing personnel, kid, Cold Steel chuckled. Before the Shy Guy could make another move, Cold Steel turned and unloaded the magazines of his two pistols into the Shy Guy, while Shadow provided suppressing fire with his M16. Meanwhile, Knuckles kept punching at the monster, and any time the Shy Guy attempted to attack one of them, Sonic sped in and pulled them out of harm's way. They were a perfectly organized team, and soon enough, the Shy Guy was temporarily incapacitated. Looks like he's down, but not for long, Sonic said. It's time to finish this. That's when Tails descended, his arms filled with the last thing they needed to conclude their terrifying ordeal, the Chaos Emeralds. And with the help of Knuckles' Master Emerald, they could send this abomination back to wherever it came from and never worry about it again. With the power of the Chaos Emeralds, there was another almighty flash just like the one that had brought the monster here. When the smoke cleared, the monster was gone, returned to the place from whence it came. Sonic sighed and said, well, at least we don't have to deal with Dr. Robotnik anymore. The boy and his father have spent the entire morning cleaning out the basement of the boy's grandfather, and the boy is absolutely exhausted. After yet another trip up those rickety cellar steps, the boy collapses onto the old living room couch. He can still hear his father puttering around downstairs, yelping and gasping in surprise every time he finds some memento of his childhood stashed among the debris. The boy sighs in annoyance. He doesn't really know his grandfather, so he doesn't feel any sense of loss as they tear through the boxes and bags in the basement. His father, however, insisted that the boy come along. It'll be good for us to spend some time together, he said, and the boy suspects that his father is trying to deal with his own guilt about his strained relationship with the boy's grandfather. Perhaps he hopes that a day of father-son bonding is just what they need to make sure that they don't grow apart as his father did with his grandfather. The boy, however, doesn't think that cleaning out a musty old basement should qualify as effective father-son bonding. It's super boring. Worse, it turns out that the boy's deceased grandfather was an absolute hoarder who couldn't throw anything away, so the house is filled with all sorts of worthless garbage. The boy groans, his feet ache from traipsing all those stairs, and his back aches from carrying boxes. He thinks that he deserves a little break. He pulls a small handheld gaming console from the pocket of his hoodie and turns it on. I'll just play for a couple minutes, he thinks to himself, then I'll go and help Dad some more. He won't mind if I take a short break to recover. The boy is sitting on the battered couch in the living room, playing the latest game on his handheld game console, when his father lurches into the room, carrying a gigantic white plastic box in his arms. Check it out, sport, says his dad, a wide grin on his face. Look what I just found in the basement. The boy briefly looks up from his game, resisting the temptation to roll his eyes at his father's annoying enthusiasm. His father is always getting excited for the dumbest things. As for that white box, the boy's never seen anything like it. 
It's a Sega Dreamcast, the father says as he sets the white box on the living room floor and starts to untangle the massive wires protruding from the back of the object. This was my favorite video game system when I was a kid. I guess your grandfather just couldn't throw it away. What else is new? mutters the boy under his breath. Buddy bites his tongue as he watches his father studiously pick apart the knots in the tangled wires. Obviously, this hunk of junk has big sentimental value for his dad. Reluctantly, he slides off the couch and takes a seat next to his father on the floor, and together, the two of them set up the Dreamcast. This had all the best games, continues his father. Soul Calibur, Sega vs. Capcom, oh, you're gonna love these. After a few minutes, his father has the wires plugged into the television, and the hand controller's ready. He nudges his son in the side with his elbow. What do you say, champ? You ready to go mano a mano against your old man with some real video games? I'm about to school you in what real games are like, none of this silly, what's it called, Among Us junk like you played today. It's not called Among Us, Dad, mutters the boy under his breath, but his father is already distracted pulling out old games. His father holds up a CD clamshell and pries it open, revealing a stack of silvery discs. And look at this, all my old games, too. The boy tries to contain his boredom as his father rattles off a list of his favorite old video games, none of which are familiar to the boy. But eventually, his father reaches one disc that isn't familiar. Eurythmics? He says, squinting at the title embossed across the disc. I don't remember this one. I wonder if your grandfather got it after I moved out. The father pauses as if overcome with emotion. The boy can imagine what his father is thinking. Did his grandfather buy this disc knowing how much his father loved his Dreamcast video games and hoping that maybe it could serve as a reconciliation present between them? That's exactly the sort of dopey, sentimental thing that his dad would think after spending all morning going through his grandfather's junk and reminiscing about what could have been. Uh, it looks like it's some sort of dance game, prompts the boy, hoping to get his father to focus more on the game than his feelings of nostalgia and loss. Oh, right, right, says the father. I wonder why Grandpa had this when he didn't have a dance mat to connect. Maybe you just have to hit the control buttons in rhythm? Hmm. He holds it up, the reflective disc shining brightly in the light of the overhead lamp and the boy stares at the silvery disc in confusion. He's seen pictures of CD-ROM discs before, in old catalogs or even movies, but he's never seen one in real life. Who even uses discs like that anymore? Everything's just downloadable from the internet these days. What is that anyway? asks the boy. A CD? This is not a CD, says his father, a slight edge of annoyance in his voice. The boy rolls his eyes. His father is always acting like he should be familiar with the outdated dinosaur technology of his father's youth. When will his dad learn? Just because this junk was important to his father when he was growing up doesn't mean that it's still important to the next generation. The boy holds his tongue, knowing that his father will probably start to sulk if he's reminded that time marches on, and that he's no longer as hip and with it as he likes to think he is. It's a GD-ROM says his father, as if those words are supposed to mean anything to the boy. It stands for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory. The boy has no clue what that means, and he hopes that his father isn't about to start a lecture on the different kinds of obsolete video game tech that he's suddenly decided are so vitally important for his son to know about. Luckily, his dad doesn't launch into a long-winded talk. He's too curious about what's on this mysterious disk to bother about that now. The father shoves the disk into the Dreamcast and settles down on the floor, gripping the controller with both hands. He's as excited as a kid in a candy store as he waits for the screen to boot up. The boy can't remember the last time that his father has been so eager for anything. But his excitement is short-lived as the first loading screen boots up. A cheerful, happy melody plays from the Dreamcast speakers. The game title, Eurythmics, flashes on screen with options for one or two players listed below it. The father clicks over to two players, nodding for his son to pick up the other controller. The boy does as he's told. He can't imagine that this game is going to be any good. How old is it, anyway? It's from when his dad was a kid, so that's all the way back in the 90s. This game might as well be a hundred years old for all the boy cares. Immediately when the father chooses two players, the screen starts to glitch. The father yells in frustration, throwing his controller to the floor, but the boy sighs in relief. Thank God, at least now he won't have to pretend that this dinosaur game is anything good. I guess it's busted, says the boy, ready to turn away from the Dreamcast. But his father is insistent. No, no, it's just warming up. Watch, I'll fix this. He grabs his controller and tries to click on two players again. The screen only glitches more. Okay, okay, just give me a minute, says the father. If this doesn't work, I'll just take the disc out and blow on it. I'm sure that'll work. The boy stares in confusion. It's a disc, not a cartridge. He doesn't see any way that blowing on it will have any effect. His father is just desperately grasping at straws, upset that his attempt at father-son bonding is being thwarted. Meanwhile, the cheerful loading screen music starts to fray. 
stuck repeating a single reverberating note that gradually degenerates into a tuneless cacophony. The pixels shimmy and wobble on screen, the image fracturing worse and worse as the father struggles to get the game console to respond to his commands. The boy watches the screen with disinterest at first, but then… wait, what's going on? The more he stares at the screen, the more the random noises and broken graphics seem to form into something strange, something unknowable, but also something vaguely coherent? He blinks in confusion, his jaw dropping. He wants to call his father's attention to the bizarre formations on screen, but his father is too busy wrestling with the controller to notice the effect that he's having. Dad, Dad, look at the screen, says the boy, grabbing his father's shoulder and pointing. Huh, what is it, did it work? What the? The father furrows his brow in confusion as he notices the wildly oscillating image on the TV screen for the first time. That doesn't look like a Dreamcast game at all. It's all broken, I, I think. The colors swirl around the screen in hypnotic, psychedelic patterns, and both father and son find themselves mesmerized, unable to look away. The boy is only vaguely aware of what computer graphics in the late 90s would have looked like, but he's reasonably sure that no underpowered 90s console could produce something this wild. The boy feels himself getting groggy, his brain fogging over as he stares at the wildly oscillating shapes on the screen. He feels like he could almost make sense of them if he just tried hard enough. It's like looking at one of those old-fashioned magic eye pictures, where the image only collapses into sense if you cross your eyes just right, but these strange swirls of color are something far beyond that. The swirls spiral into distinct vortex patterns, to the point that the boy might almost believe that he's looking at… eyes. Yes, that's it, he's sure of it. He wants to panic as he becomes aware of the sensation of being watched. He feels like something beyond the screen, some malevolent entity has somehow gained access to his world via this video game and is now watching him, sizing him up like a predator would size up its prey. He can't think of anything except those staring eyes with their rotating pupils. He wants to fall forward and disappear into the eternal nothingness of those awful eyes. Next to him, his father is silent. Like the boy, he's also enraptured by the infinite eyes on screen. Oh my god, he mutters, so quiet that the boy can barely hear him. Do you? Do you see the eyes? It's your grandfather. He's watching us from beyond. I know that's him. The boy doesn't know whether his father is right. His father is probably just letting his guilt color his perception, because the boy doesn't feel like there's human intelligence on the other side of the screen. Whatever is out there, whether it's an alien mind from beyond human ken, or simply a computer program given awful sentience by a freak accident, it's not something that the boy can even begin to comprehend. He feels his mind shutting down in the face of that terror, as if his brain simply cannot take the strain anymore. He's only vaguely aware of his father hitting the floor in a dead faint. That should worry him. He should be frightened. He should want to rush to his father's side and try to shake him back awake. But his brain can't make his body respond. He feels his arms and legs getting weak and his eyelids getting heavy. It isn't long before his eyes drift shut and the boy collapses onto the floor next to his father. Hours later, after the sun has already set, a car pulls up in front of the house and the boy's mother gets out. She frowns as she looks at the front of the house, noting that the lights are on inside and the front bay window casts a yellow square of light across the front lawn. The boy and his father must still be inside. They were supposed to have finished moving all that junk hours ago. She's tried calling both of their cell phones to remind them that they should be home for dinner, but neither father nor son has answered any of her calls or texts. She's not worried, though. They often ignore their phones when they get really involved in an activity, and she suspects, rightly, that her husband probably found some childhood relic in the basement that's distracted him from getting the task done. She's willing to bet that the two of them probably haven't even finished cleaning the basement. She walks up the garden path and puts her hand against the doorknob. The door creaks open. She frowns. Nothing sinister about that, right? Of course, they wouldn't bother to lock the door if they were still working inside, right? Nevertheless, she feels a strange chill run up her spine. Why is she suddenly so nervous? She pushes open the door and fumbles for the light switch. The foyer is dark, as is most of the house. The only light comes from the living room, and she can see that something within is throwing dancing shadows against the far wall. She hears a toneless, mechanical drone emanating from the living room. Are they watching television? That would be just like them to turn on the tube and completely lose track of time. 
but what TV show would make an awful din like that? She storms into the living room, ready to read her husband and son the riot act, but then she stops dead in her tracks. Her husband and son are here all right, but they're lying in crumpled heaps upon the floor, staring glassy-eyed at the ceiling. She screams as she rushes to her husband, praying that she's wrong, that they're just playing a prank on her, that they just got tired and lay down on the floor to rest. But as she presses her finger against his wrist, she feels that he's cold and lifeless. He's dead, and has been for hours. Her son, pale and cold and lifeless, lies next to him. She looks up, her gaze connecting with the television screen. It continues to flash vacillating images in an erratic loop, nonsense static that she can't understand. But if she didn't know better, she might almost feel like it's watching her. The strange, swirling eyes stare back, unblinking and eternal. What started as a misguided attempt at father-son bonding time ended in tragedy, because those GD-ROM discs weren't ordinary discs at all, but rather instances of what the SCP Foundation has dubbed SCP-4904. SCP-4904 is a set of seven modified GD-ROM discs manufactured by the Sega Corporation. SCP Foundation agents have been able to pinpoint the date of manufacture of each disc sometime between 1997 and 1999. The GD-ROM was a proprietary format originally used for the Dreamcast video game console, developed by Yamaha as an answer to fighting the piracy that was rampant among more standard compact discs, and to offer increased storage capacity without the expense of the fledgling DVD-ROM. The GD-ROM seemed promising at the time, as it had a storage capacity of a full gigabyte, 42% higher than conventional CDs. Ultimately though, GD-ROMs failed to catch on and were quickly outpaced by DVD technology. The seven discs in the SCP Foundation storage are visually indistinguishable from non-anomalous GD-ROM discs, except for their serial numbers. The serial numbers give some indication of the mystery behind their origin, revealing that they were created by Sega's enigmatic R&D Zero division during the height of the 90s console wars. It is estimated that R&D Zero produced a total of between 60 and 100 experimental GD-ROM discs similar to those in SCP-4904, but the rest of the production line is currently unaccounted for. Each SCP-4904 GD-ROM contains one Sega video game, including Sonic Adventure, Sega Rally Championship 2, House of the Dead 2, Sega Bass Fishing, Godzilla Generations, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, and an unreleased 3D rhythm game by the name of Eurythmics. But the result when anyone tries to play any of these different games is always the same. When an instance of SCP-4904 is fed into a Dreamcast console, it causes the optical disk drive's reader to move in unpredictable ways, accessing disk data seemingly at random. At first, the game boots up as expected and seems perfectly ordinary, but when a player progresses past the loading screen, the game very quickly becomes illegible. Sprites and assets blend into each other in asymmetrical chunks, maps recursively render onto other maps, and soundtracks transform within seconds into incessant, oscillating noise. A perfunctory glance at the results seems like absolute chaos, but eventually, observers will start to notice patterns within the noise. These eventually coalesce into complex renderings of landscapes and figures wildly inconsistent with the content of the original games, and computationally impossible for 1990s-era video game hardware to render. Repeated tests by SCP Foundation agents have turned up a recurring motif in the images shown by SCP-4904, spinning disks that resemble malevolent eyes. SCP agents hope that research into R&D Zero and the man responsible for the disk's creation might help to explain the reason or the purpose of SCP-4904. R&D Zero's former lead hardware programmer Ken Matsuya has said on record that the team encountered numerous problems in implementing the disk's anti-piracy encryption measures. The result was unplayable. Frustrated by this failure, Sega ordered that the encryption project be abandoned and the prototype disks quietly destroyed. However, it does not appear that Sega's orders were carried out to the letter. Matsuya himself rescued seven of the disks, hoping to learn more about the issue on his own time, and it's possible that other disks not currently known to the Foundation also survived. With the help of improvised Sega hardware, Matsuya spent the next four years trying to understand the cause behind the disks' erratic behavior. Notebooks recovered from his apartment contain numerous sketches of the disk-generated visuals. Depicting fractal combinations of landscape and figures seemingly drawn from places outside of the game data themselves, and stylized spinning disks in the shape of eyes. Matsuya himself met a strange and untimely end when he was found dead from a heart attack in his apartment in August 2003. 
Stranger still, an autopsy revealed that large portions of his brainstem and limbic system were missing. His death puzzled authorities, since there was no evidence of any human, or even non-human, intrusion. Matsuya had apparently loaded one of the SCP-4904 instances in his possession into his home Dreamcast before his death, because the distinctive psychedelic visuals were playing on his television screen at the time that his body was discovered. Foundation agents suspected that the visuals might have some connection with Matsuya's death, leading to the disc's subsequent classification and containment, but intensive tests on SCP-4904 by Foundation personnel have failed to shed any light on the situation. Both the disc's strange behavior and Matsuya's death remain complete mysteries. Is SCP-4904 a gateway into some other dimension, and its bizarre images a signal from another world? Could it be a message from beyond the veil? Or is it all just due to a simple computer glitch and Matsuya's death just a freak coincidence? Whatever the case, the Foundation is doing its best to uncover the truth. SCP-4904 has been given the object class safe, but should be stored in conditions comparable to those needed to keep non-anomalous disks viable. All seven instances of SCP-4904 are kept in a climate-controlled safe class storage locker at Site-15. Long-term tests lasting over an hour should only be conducted on reinforced, modified hardware to prevent disk deformation or explosion. If you want to support our important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life, for another nightmarish twist on a nostalgic piece of gaming hardware. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.